Good morning. I'd like to welcome you to the Board of Com County Commissioners meeting for today, June 3rd, 2020. Please join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Um, I don't believe we have any public comment this morning. I haven't been made aware of any, um, any citizen input. Uh, we do have a consent agenda. I have a couple of things I wanted to say before we got to the consent agenda. So um, just because I know a lot of us, have, a lot of you and everybody here have had uh, children that have gone through the school system. I got to go through graduation 2020 yesterday with my son, which by itself was really exciting and uh, really rewarding. Um, but I thought you'd be interested to know how well the schools are doing, what the sacrifice it's taking on people like the principal. They literally are taking each student one by one and groups of like 20 or 12 each hour, one by one, the, they take the student in and the family in and, um, and uh, put the, do this whole ceremony basically with that one student. They do the tassel. He talks to the principal. Uh, we all take, we can take whatever pictures we want. In bigger groups, they take more pictures. And then they walk out and they take another set of pictures. But the principal literally, it will be there all week this week doing these one at a time graduations for every student. I assume the other schools are like this too. And it's just a huge amount of work. And they're doing distance spacing in line of like 15 feet as you walk in as a group. It's, it's amazing, uh, but it's interesting that how much it's changing uh, the whole experience for graduation. So I think it'll be known as, you know, 2020 graduation will have this own asterisk on it, but, but it, they're doing a great job. And I wanted to just say that to Bend High School, and I'm sure the other high schools are doing the same thing, but really interesting. Well, congratulations, Dad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and there's hundreds of graduates from uh, these large Bend high schools because I've, yeah. I've experienced 75 or 80 at Lapine High School where it's a small little family and then the uh, uh, fairgrounds in Redmond where there's just hundreds and it's just a, a machine when they do it. So this is a special moment for those kids being able to graduate and take some time for each one. It's yeah. a moment in your life. You know, they, they probably get got a piece a of paper now that says you graduated. They, they get, would normally. Yeah. They, the one thing they kept, because Bendai has 400 graduates, they, they were clearly pointing out that they didn't have to sit at the fairgrounds for yeah. hours watching each person walk across. In a normal ceremony, the principals don't say anything. They're not, they just pass them out. So a lot this more was personal. a lot more personal yeah. way, and there were other people that said, you know, we're there to say congratulations. So That's just cool. thought it'd be interesting yeah. for everybody that, gone through this and knows how important it is. So. Well, on another personal note, then, uh, happy anniversary to my wife, 26 years tomorrow. So everybody uh, gets to celebrate that sooner or later. But yeah, we're working our way up there, 26 years tomorrow. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you very much. That's outstanding. OK, well, I won't mention my husband today. <laughs> He's home helping me out. There so you go. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> yes. it's in, it's critical what he gets to help me with so thank you <clears throat> thank you honey um, we have a consent agenda now well, I'll move uh, approval of consent agenda is there a second yeah I'll second that and then okay. uh, yeah a couple just thank yous yeah you know we've got a couple of reappointments or an appointment and a reappointment uh, for the Planning Commission so thank you very much uh, Planning Commission is quite a commitment uh, uh, you know meetings deep deep topics uh, and also we're looking for that Southern Deschutes County Planning Commissioner still also. And uh, I'm going to get back around to that here pretty soon. Yes, I would like to um, thank Susan Altman for joining our Planning Commission. I know she's going to be an extremely outstanding uh, member of that panel. And it's, it is a huge commitment. It's, um, it'll be um, great to hear from Susan. And thank you for joining that team. So and thank you for Les for reappointing, and he is our current chair. So thank you, Les, Les Hudson. So um, with that, uh, Commissioner Devon? Yes. Commissioner Henderson? Oh, yes. And the chair votes yes for the consent agenda. We've actually revised our agenda right now. Um, I would like to um, acknowledge uh, Tim Shimke, who's in the room with um, some of my closest 
um, what is the word? We see each other at a lot of events, and we've been missing each other. So thank yes, you, Susan true. and Christine, for coming today. And um, yes, I think we saw each other last at maybe the gala for the Crooked River Roundup. Was that it? That was the last one. Okay. Well, here we are. Tim. Good morning. For the record, Tim Shinkley, Director of the Department of Solid Waste. Um, Corinne and Stuart Martinez, the owners of Lapine Disposal, which does businesses wilderness garbage and recycling, have decided to sell their business to Republic Services. Um, the order in front of you is uh, uh, the transfer of the franchise from Lapine Disposal to Republic. Um, this is fairly straightforward uh, compared to the transfer of all the other <laughs> franchises that went to Republic the last time we were in front here. So the, the transfer is, is addressed in Deschutes County Code, Chapter 13. Um, really, um, basically, um, they have, we have to know that the, the person who is acquiring the, the franchise has experience, assets, and the means to carry on the business. And obviously, Republic Disposal is well qualified in that regard. One other item here that is asked to be transferred is uh, um, Wilderness currently leases a, a lot in the Lapine Business Park next to their corporate yard, um, and uh, that transfer of that interest in that lease to Republic is also on this in this order. And this transfer is applicable today, then, for our document. Um, the the other requirement in the code is that um, Wilderness needs to be current with Deschutes County for any fees or or other obligations, and and in the next. 20 days or so, we will work through that. Um, get Wilderness's final report for 2019, and and they have paid the majority of their franchise fees already. But that trues that up, and we and we we make that whole. Um, so we don't see any problems here moving forward. Commissioner, there is an amended order. I don't know if Sharon that up to you folks yet, but she did send it up. Yeah, it has a. I provided a red line, and then also the new clean one, and it just indicates that the, it'll become effective as of the date of the transfer, uh, provided that that occurs prior to July 30th. So if something happens and it falls out, they're going to have to come back through this if they haven't dotted all their I's by July 30th. Okay, and the June 3rd was removed then. Yes. Good. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. And Terry O'Sullivan's here. He's, he's counsel, a local counsel on this as well. So if you have any questions in that context, I'm sure he could address those as well. What, um, I, the only question I'd add, I guess I didn't know this was in the works, is uh, and what is there some em emergency we're operating under, or is this just how franchises transfers real quickly? Or yeah, the county code requires within 30 days of the notification request for the board to take action. It's a vestige of the county code from many decades ago. And so the request was made um, this week, or. I believe May 14th, if oh. I'm not mistaken. That's the, yeah, the date on the letter from Wilderness to us. So a couple uh, thoughts. I called uh, Stu Martinez yesterday, uh, and he mentioned a little bit of history of the situation. Martinez family came in in 1984 and uh, took this, and I don't know the history before that, but 1984 is when they started. And... Um, Stu came in the summer of 1992, their, their son. Uh, it was Gil and Corrine Martinez for many years. Stu thought he was going to be here for one summer. Was, he thought he was going to, left home, came back, and thought he was just passing through. Um, so, yeah, uh, that was his 1992 summer job. And uh, since then, uh, Gil has passed away. But uh, there was a Gil Martinez Community Service Award in this Chamber of Commerce. Uh, it's the uh, you know quiet unsung hero service award for the Lapine Chamber, real special. Hmm. So, thanks for the background. That's it. I didn't yeah. know all that. I, I know the, the Martinez's, but I didn't know the history. That's pretty interesting. When I talk, spoke to Stu yesterday, it was real emotional, and it's kind of catching me right now too. He was the first mayor in, in 2006, so that's the fun part about that, too. So people that actually give back to the community consistently. Oh, very much so. And Can Cancer is the, uh, you know, effort that started uh, probably, you know, at, at Gill's uh, 
uh, cancer possibly, and uh, you know, long history there. Can cancer has been a big effort, and that's going to be a focus of Kareen in uh, in her days now too. So, real positive, you know, small hometown service that has been just part of the community, deeply part of the community for many years. Do we want to hear anything from? Um, public's representatives or their lawyers about what they're excited to do or anything important like that or um. oh wait till we wipe it off though remember <laughs> we have to wipe the, the, the wipes are right behind you Tim thank you I just thank oh, you nobody's getting sick on our watch yeah, yeah. There you we're, go. We're, we're really careful here <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm the general manager for public services. Oh, do you want to introduce your name again so that we yes. can hear you? Kristen, Thank you. Sorry about that. Kristen Steiner, Republic Services of Central Oregon, general manager. Um, we are very humbled that Stu and Corinne chose Republic to take on the legacy that they that they started out in Lapine and, and in the county there. And, um, we, of course, just like we did with Bend Garbage High Country Disposal in Prineville, we, we plan on keeping every single employee, every driver, every technician, every customer service agent and representative, um, and to take on all the, the traditions as well that they had in mm -hmm. the Pine. Um, they were huge parts of the community, um, major members, huge, you know, a voice, a face, and um, I don't know that we'll ever be able to fill those shoes completely, but it is our intention to keep on all traditions and everything that they participated in, sponsored, and donated to. Um, so we're just we're just really humbled. They're a great group of people, excellent equipment and fleet maintenance, and just yeah, stellar parts of the of the community there. So we're really excited. Thanks for saying that. Yeah. I'm on the um, Sun River Lapine Economic Development Board. We're all parts of different parts of it, EDCO related things and. So if you haven't been to a board meeting, you should, we'll invite you to the next one because I'm sure you'll be a part of it. Stu was part of it for a long time, um, and uh, so that'd be great. So, well, congratulations. You know, big choice made by the family. So, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it'll be a transfer, but we can handle it. And uh, yeah, the the drivers, everybody always waves. You know, real positive. Yes, they're very tight knit, close group, smaller group. You know, for. For us, that that makes it even you know just more special. They're and they're very being very welcoming of us too. So oh, we yeah. appreciate that. Great. And thank you for saying to keep the traditions because you know that's what happens sometimes when we have big global companies come in and then the support of the local community is decimated. And you know that's really not what we would want to happen in our county. So thank you for saying that, Chrissy. Yes, of course. Good morning, Commissioners. This is Christy Bollinger. Um, I just wanted to weigh in to let you know that I've been talking with Republic, uh, specifically Ryan Lawler, and also Dave Doyle and County Council, and we're working through uh, kind of a refresh of the lease. The last lease that was done with um, Lapine Disposal was back in uh, 2010, 2011. So we thought this would be a good opportunity to re refresh it. So we're, we're, we'll be coming back to your board um, in the next couple weeks with a refresh on that. So I just wanted to give you a heads up. Thank you, Christy. You're welcome. Do we need to know anything else or should we proceed? No, I, I just wanted to add, um, oh. I did speak with, with uh, Stuart yesterday as well and it was very emotional and long-term relationship. And um, I asked him at one point, I said, well, what are his future plans? And uh, and he said, you know, he just might get back into local politics and get on the city council again. And uh, the last time he was there, um, Wilderness was requesting that the city of the Pine consider curbside collection of recyclables. Um, but um, since he had a conflict of interest, he had to recuse, recuse himself from that decision on the council. And so I said, well, you get back in there, Stuart, and we'll get curbside out there in the Pine before you know it. So <laughs> That's a, Terry, yeah, that, that curbside's a really great idea. Terry has something. Oh, Terry? Yeah, oh, Sullivan. Oh, Terry. Yes, would you like to? Oh, thank you, Tim. Uh, Terry O'Sullivan, I represent the Martinez family individually. I also represent the, the garbage company 
First, with regard to the continuation of public service, one of the reasons this is the last of the three sales in the in the region to Republic is that Kareen specifically wanted to observe Republic and see how they did in following through with their commitment to continue uh, civic involvement. They've done it. We expect them to continue, and, and they're certain that they will. On a more personal note, I first came up here in 1974 oh, there's the on history. solid waste issues with, I believe, Abe Young, Clay Shepard, and I forget who else. I can't remember who was county council at that time. I know we went through Rick Isham later. And I just wanted to, uh, this, is, this is my swan song on yeah. garbage company stuff. Oh. <laughs> and so I just wanted to thank the county from this date going clear back to 1974. Even though we've had some headbutting at times, it's always been handled business-wise, professionally, and uh, it's always worked out. So from the Martinez family and from me personally, thank you. Well, I just want to say, Terry, it's good to see you here. To, and I think I appreciate how long you've served them, but I've just been a you know active member of the legal community and practicing. I really admire that. And two years. yeah, that's amazing. And uh, others have retired much earlier. And I think it's it's good to keep going as long as you can. So thank. What are you going to do? Stay home and wax the garage floor? Yeah. <laughs> well, you could, but. <laughs> anyway, yep. so thanks a lot. Thanks. Oh, thank you. Thank Here's you for those you. complimentary words and um, the professionalism. And I'm so glad that um, watching, it's one thing when somebody says something, but actually doing what they say. And um, I'm really proud that they put the commitment to our traditions and our public um, here in Deschutes County. So um, it's, it's a great chapter to close and hope, you know, looking for good things coming from Republic. So thank you all. Great. Well, with that discussion, I'll uh, move board signature of order number 2020-028, transferring solid waste franchise and consenting to identified assignment. And I'll second that. Any further discussion? Commissioner DeBone? Yes. Commissioner Henderson? Yes. And the chair votes yes. Congratulations. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Oh. All right. Nahad, I'm sorry we had to um, take care of that business. Um, are you available now? Commissioners, I'm here. Thank I you so much. You. We've got your um, PowerPoint, so if you want to go yes. ahead. So thank you, Commissioner. My name is Nahad Sadrazadi. I'm the Director of Public Health with the Shute County Health Services. Uh, first of all, congratulations to Commissioners, Henderson, uh, Commissioners uh, Henderson and DeBone for the great news they shared earlier about their families. Commissioner DeBone, you make the rest of us look badly, I suppose, uh, because we didn't uh, publicly acknowledge our um, anniversaries. My anniversary was a couple of days ago. So. Oh, there you go. Well, you had your chance just now. Thank you. You see my shared screen at this stage? Yes, please. We see it. Tom has kindly reminded me that uh, we have only a few minutes today. So um, with that in mind, I'd like to ask for what is your priority and what information you'd like me to share with you this morning. I have some, as usual, some uh, data from global and national level. I have local data to share with you. I have update on the long-term care facilities, and I have some critical messages for the community. So what would you like me to cover in the next? Oh, that was um, really short. Uh, this is Commissioner DeBone. The one question is just uh, kind of supplies, if you have update on supplies. I know kind of the incident management team and uh, uh, providers, that's been a, an issue, just understanding the supply chain and the current status. I think for me, um, anything you can share about the, you know, the continued testing plans, one of the specific ones we talked about on Monday that we didn't know the answer to was what um, I think it was last Monday that um, Dr. Conway had said that the health department was working on a plan for testing of all long-term care facility personnel and um, people that live there. And so update on that also. And sure, Nahad, I, I would like you, if you could possibly point out, are the 20 to 29-year-olds still our highest percentage of positive cases? 
in Deschutes County, which because that's a, a unique trend per the state um, numbers from what I've been watching. So I'm just wondering, are they still our largest percentage of carriers? Okay. Yeah, I have, uh, so starting with the local data, so commissioners, I got the three points. Uh, Commissioner DeBone, I am sorry I might disappoint you today because I generally, um, uh, Nathan uh, has, uh, is custodian of that information. So if in the future uh, you expect to hear that from uh, me, I'd be happy to touch base with him and uh, make sure I have that information readily available. Well, it's just um, a kind of a data point for today, talking about a phase two and understanding the uh, supply chain. So, I mean, we can find that information. It's just one of those sure. things that came up recently. No, it's a good point. It's a good point. So we'll we'll make sure we kind of close that loop for you yep. um, for everyone a bit later. Thank on you. the testing plans, uh, I can definitely cover uh, the progress around the long-term care facilities, and uh, hopefully Dr. Conway can, I don't know if he's already here or not, but he can also join in and give an update on the TRACE project. I do have some highlights that I can share in case he doesn't join. And then in terms of um, the, maybe we can start with uh, Commissioner Adair's request on, on the age categories. And I think uh, last time uh, uh, we presented also uh, one of the commissioners, maybe it was Commissioner Henderson or Commissioner there, I don't recall, asked about the hospitalization by sex and age group. Um, so I have that information also in front of me. That's on slide, I think, 23. Yes, I, found, I just found it. Thank you. Right. So maybe we can, um, so the short answer for you, Commissioner, there, there is that, yes, that group is still, um, is still there uh, as one of the highest affected age groups. And you can see this on this slide, which is age 20 to 29. Uh, at 28 out of 127. So that group is affected and that group is uh, a concern for all of us um, um, in terms of adhering to some of the precautionary measures, especially wearing masks or mask usage. So I would like to uh, use this platform as well to send a strong message to that, um, um, that age group um, uh, in terms of um, their responsibility, not only towards themselves, but towards the community and towards our businesses um, and, and of course the most vulnerable groups. So that group, as you can see, is, is still affected. Um, and that's a national trend as well, by the way. I have data in this slide deck, which also show that nationally that group so that is also affected. So this virus is clearly showing that it's an equal opportunity virus in terms of who it infects. Um, but of course, in terms of its impact and, and morbidity and mortality, especially, um, the older age group is still disproportionately affected by them. And this slide as well, just very quickly, if you allow me, is uh, looking at hospitalization by sex and age groups. And we see that a higher proportion of men um, uh, are hospitalized of those infected. And ages 60 plus, a higher proportion of them also are hospitalized. Uh, I think this was a question you had last time, and I hope this uh, addresses it. So, uh, before you go forward on that, so why didn't you go ahead and break it down to the 20 to 29? I mean, there's five below 40, but they may all be in their 30s. So that's a, that's an interesting thing to us in terms of, well, there's a lot more infection going around, but um, if they're not being hospitalized, it's that's it would be interesting. Yes. So the, the, dark, it, the dark blue is the number of cases, right, or the number of hospitalizations. Right. Uh, so, Commissioner, as you see, age under 40, the five is the hospitalized out of 58. So, 58 folks yeah. in so that. How many, under, are under, how many are under 30 of that? So that, that group uh, is in this slide here. As you can see, the 20 to 29 is 28. No, I mean, or, how many are hospitalized? Because. So of the five, if that's what you're referring to, if of the five, how many are 30 to 39 and 20 to 29? Uh, I believe majority of them are 30 to 39. I don't think uh, we have as many in 2029. I don't have the data in front of me, but I can uh, give that to you. But of the five commissioner, I mean, that number is so low that I don't think you're going to have a statistical sort of significant uh, breakdown anyway. So okay. Nahad, well, you were saying that the you, uh, younger trend is actually national, but is it in the state of Oregon also? Because the last time I looked at the numbers, it was still showing 
40 to 49 and 50 to 59 as being the larger groups of positives. So has, has Oregon changed and followed that trend? Yeah, so Commissioner, the, this is the slide in front of you uh, or in sort of on the screen, and it's number 10. I don't know if the numbers have changed. Uh, this slide shows, shows the national data and the local data from Oregon um, are not local in terms of our county, but Oregon emitters uh, what's, what we're seeing nationally as well. Um, so this, uh, these two age cohorts definitely um, uh, are now equally affected by this compared to what we were seeing earlier. So that is a national ch uh, chart then? This is a national chart, but Oregon data also um, reflect this trend. I can get you those specifics, it's available. By the way, just uh, while we're at it, let me mention that Oregon uh, Health Authority now has a new uh, dashboard um, platform for uh, data visualization uh, on its website. And it's a, it's a very user-friendly tool. And this, um, uh, the dashboard provides information specific to the counties and the reopening uh, indicators. And here, as you can see, and it was discussed on Monday, five out of six, uh, the Shoe County is meeting five out of six uh, reopening indicators. Um, I think this is, you have this information handy and you're aware of it already. Anything else about the local data before I uh, move on? Here's some- well, One uh, question point or topic I guess I want to talk to was, I don't know what slide it is. It's the one where the, uh, I guess it's the daily count of COVID-19 patients hospitalized. And it's kind of a perfect up and down back in late March, early April. And then even when we had the, you know, the high number of tested positives back on the week, um, well, it's the week of the 14th or 15th through the 23rd or whatever, even then the hospitalizations kept going down. And I just, any comments, I mean, it, if you just were a lay person, you'd almost look at this like, boy, the the, and I, I remember back in the early days, the hospitals were saying only come in if you meet all these tests. And be there. so there was a really a high uh, number of hospitalization for the number of testing and the number of cases we had back then versus now. It almost looks like a weakening of, uh, if you're just a lay person, you look like, well, it's, we may have upticks, but we're not having the same um, impact to the people getting it and it's I don't know if there's any comments on that but is first is what I'm saying makes sense and then second um, no what you're saying makes sense Commissioner Henderson and I think Dr. Conway alluded to this uh, during the last uh, uh, presentation which is we we basically saw a shift in terms of the draft uh, demographics of those uh, exposed and infected by this vi uh, virus so the earlier crowds were uh, mostly the older folks uh, traveling and probably exposed to higher uh, viral load as well. And um, as, uh, as we, and, and they're of course, they have underlying conditions and they're probably on crews and more crowded areas as they're traveling uh, in, in airplanes or what have you. So they certainly were more vulnerable to begin with. And, um, uh, and of course, uh, uh, they were um, affected and hospitalized accordingly. And then later, as we see um, the trend uh, shifting towards the younger demographics, um, they're healthier, more active, and uh, more outdoors probably. So their, their um, exposure was not the same. And, and in that sense, Commissioner, I wanted to also put this slide, I put it in here, just um, I don't want to get too sort of um, uh, academic about this, but I think it's a useful diagram. Um, I don't know if you were able to see it, age and host and environment. So this is called the it's epidemiologic. It's like the third page in our packet. Okay, so it's called the epidemiologic, tri uh, basically um, the triangle. And in epidemiology, uh, we look at uh, a disease from the from uh, the sort of the angles of agent, which is the virus, the host, which is us, and the environment. So that's basically everything around us. In some cases, we also add the vector, which is you know a mosquito or what have you. And the idea here is that as we uh, try to um, uh, try to break the chain of transmission by focusing on one or more of these area, uh, one, one or more of these uh, 
corners that you see in front of you, the agent, the host, the environment. Um, and, and I think in this case, Commissioner, the reason I'm mentioning this is that your question around how the hospitalization and what have you, uh, there probably could be a couple of, uh, I, we, would, we can answer that question. We don't have definitive answers, but we can answer it by looking at the agent, which is the virus. Could the virus have mutated to become less contagious or less, let's say, uh, severe? That's one, something that we need to, that's a hypothesis we need to investigate further. Or we can look at it from the host and what, what is happening with the host, where the host immunized. Obviously, there's no vaccine, so that's not the case. So what was happening with their age, maybe their, the demographics were different. So those are hypotheses that then we take and try to investigate further. Uh, uh, in this case, it seems like a reasonable answer is around the host and uh, the demographic uh, changes that we saw. Does that make sense, Commissioner? Yeah, it does. It, it, it opens up a lot of questions, you know, about uh, were, were a lot more people infected back in late March, April that didn't get, di you know, didn't get tested is one issue. So it, you know, that would have been a much bigger number maybe that's one and then the other is maybe all the people that are most vulnerable have been the most locked down so or you know and then all the other things like you're saying about the host but it it kind of runs yeah. like other i just you know it just is interesting to see we don't really know what will happen next but no that's a good point you raise about testing as well because as you i'm sure recall and others recall that that when we were testing early on, we were really just testing the most um, uh, severely affected, the ones that have very severe symptoms. And those are the ones that are probably uh, correlated with also being hospitalized. Whereas now where uh, the criteria are more relaxed and we are testing um, a lot more people with less severe symptoms. Well, that, I guess what I'm saying is, an, is what looks like an uptick may not be that big of an uptick you know, really going on is what I'm, yeah, that just based on that, that there's less hospitalizations. So, I mean, at the end of the day, that's, those are the people that have in other places died or most of them have been hospitalized, I guess, so. Yeah, so I, I, I know you have a full agenda, so, um, and, and I don't want Tom to get upset with me, so please uh, let No, we know. wouldn't want that to happen, Nahad. <laughs> but, um, do you can you address the long-term care facilities? What's happening with that? If that's, I'd be happy that, to. I'd be that would be very important because you we did have a meeting Monday from someone that does work on testing in the community. Yeah, I'd be happy to. So let me. This is. Uh, I, I hope you have the slides in front of you. If not, it's on the screen. So first, let me start by saying that uh, you know the. The support we provide uh, and the relationship we have uh, with long-term care facilities in Deschutes County or in Central Oregon is really not by accident. Uh, there were deliberate decisions made to have staff in place to build a foundation of trust and relationships with these facilities. And that allows us today to access information and even sensitive information and have the door open for us to engage with them. So. I want to put that out there and say kudos to uh, those who um, made decisions to invest in this um, area. So as you know, we have around 33 long-term care facilities in Central Oregon with around 3,300 staff and residents. We have been doing and did even a more thorough assessment of the feasibility of undertaking serial surveillance. And by serial surveillance, I'm talking about basically regular testing of staff and residents uh, in these um, long-term care facilities. And, and from the very beginning, it's evident that it's not feasible for serial testing to happen uh, by the county itself. So we have to work with long-term care facilities and private providers and facil facilities to undertake um, serial uh, testing. Commissioner, currently there are no incentives in place for private sector to enter this market. And I can go through what I'm referring to in terms of incentives. There's still, we're still facing limited supply chain and funding is really um, um, unknown. I'm talking about even insurance, uh, for example, that would cover the test is unclear. Um, but from our assessment, what we know is that around half of the long-term care facilities have plans uh, uh, to undertake some level of uh, routine testing in their facilities, with one facility already, already doing some limited serial testing. So that's that's on the positive side. 
around 40 to 45 percent don't have any plans to do serial testing and there are a few mom and pop shops that have no plans period and are not even thinking about it so our uh, proposed uh, plan and the way we have approached this is that uh, we have uh, reached out to the state and we're in uh, conversations with them uh, and 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 through uh, excellent work of our team here uh, we're able to actually be one of the few counties in Oregon to start a prevalence test. This is a one-time test in a few of the long-term care facilities to just understand uh, wh what um, transmission looks like in these facilities and if there are, uh, you know, to find out um, uh, uh, who is affected and, and so on and so forth. We're not able to do all the long-term care facilities because of the limited supply chain that I mentioned um, and uh, the limitations that the state is facing right now. Uh, but we are able to, uh, in the coming week, maybe even as early as Monday, to um, go to some of the most vulnerable long-term care facilities and do this one-time test. At the same time, Commissioner, because of the assessment we've done, we have sort of a roadmap as to what else we need to be doing. We are going to start monitoring and advising those long-term care facilities that don't have, uh, that do have a plan in place uh, to do the serial test testing. We're gonna advise them because we wanna make sure they do it in a standardized and quality way. And then we're gonna work with those that don't have any plans in place and encourage them to develop plans and take this on themselves. And at the same time, we have to address some of the incentives uh, to bring in the private sector, those outside of the long-term care facilities to, uh, to look at uh, how they can be part of the solution as well. So that's in a nutshell where we are. It's a big priority for us, um, and we're focusing on it and trying to address the bottlenecks that we're facing. But I'm afraid it's not something that we can address overnight. Over to you, Commissioners. Uh, Nahad, um, Dr. Young actually suggested one of the ways to address the cost issue would be to let's put like eight swabs together um, as long as you you know, we're very clear on what your grouping was at the facilities. And then if you had a positive from those eight, you you could do that test um, a per her costing was going to be like $100. But then you would know if you needed to go back and then you would test and it, you know, then you would have the greater expense. But that would be one way in order to, um, you know, find out what we're really dealing with. Okay, thanks for sharing that, Commissioner. I, I assure you that we are definitely following the CDC and Oregon OHA guidelines on this matter, and we'll make sure that we are um, uh, that uh, that uh, all the best practices are incorporated in the way we move forward. But thank you for that. Well, we were talking actually that um, with our funding from the federal government, the you know the 1.62 billion of which Deschutes County has only been able to bill for less than a million, that um, perhaps this half half a million dollars for those 3,300 people, whatever that cost would be, could possibly be something that we could submit to the state. But you're saying the state is going to partner with us right now, but how many people are you really going to test? Right, so that, there, there, there are a couple of questions, I think, in that question. So let me see if I can unpack them. Uh, one is around uh, the cost. If, for example, we said we don't, we're not going to partner with anyone, and we're just going to take this on ourselves as a county. Um, a very quick, uh, uh, dirty calculation that I did uh, looks like it would be half a million dollars a week for us to be able to do routine testing um, um, of those 33 facilities and 3,300 uh, staff and residents which, to me, I, doesn't seem um, feasible uh, given the current economic. Uh, environment well but you need to ask i mean i don't know who you asked but i mean Are you, you know excuse me you need to ask i mean the department needs to ask about budgets i mean you don't i mean you make a conclusion that we I and mean, that's why we brought it up again today as we were told the monday before last that we were going to go we were looking at ways to maybe serve the entire long-term care facility and now a conclusion has been made without asking the three commissioners or even talking about the budget and talking about the way to do it. So as an example, I actually thought we were gonna partner with the private um, uh, medical providers in the area, which would be the hospital and the clinics and the doctors to do this. I would rather do that than, than partner with the state of Oregon to come over here and do it. But I, I just think that's the whole point is you were developing a plan and then we're here 
to give advice on whether we think it could be done or we should do it or I mean that's why we're asking you about it today well Commissioner Henderson you uh, so obviously we haven't made any conclusions I was just sharing with you sort of well, you, what quick you, you just told us your conclusions if, if I'm not mistaken you just told us your conclusions no, it's, no, maybe I didn't, I misspoke. My point was not that this is a conclusion. My point is that we also took your earlier advice into account, which is uh, this is something that we should partner with the private sector. So what I was mentioning is that if the county were to do it on its own, which is, I don't think it's, I think from what I've heard from the well, commissioners, not advisable, it would cost half a million dollars a week. That's what I was trying well, to explain. Yeah, but I mean, I don't know. You need to talk to administration and and then talk to us. I mean, you're new here, and but the department we'd run into this a lot where plans are made or not made before we're even talked to about it. And some of these we might have ideas or we might have enthusiasm for, or maybe we don't. I mean, there's a lot I can say about the conclusions you're drawing that you haven't mentioned. But you know, I just think it's interesting to see what you've conclusions you're coming to and what plans you're making, but the reason we have a county commission is is to kind of oversee some of this because we're also linked with the community and the people that live here and have maybe some opinions about that. Uh, yes, those are all true, Commissioner. And I don't think I, yeah, I, I agree with everything you're saying. And um, I'm just uh, bringing forward information based on the advice provided. I, uh, if I mentioned that there, there's, there are conclusions here that I misspoke, there are no conclusions. These are just some facts that we have, um, um, we're providing and for and recommendations for your consideration, Commissioner. So um, it, our aim, as has been advised in the past, is to work through the private sector. There are no incentives in place that would allow for that, coupled with supply chain limitations that we're facing. The one way to when you say there's no incentives, I mean an incentive to test the people in a facility would be to see if uh, you could give it kind of a real clean bill of health as opposed to waiting um, till the actual symptoms develop. That would be one. Another would be so that might be to the advantage of a facility. I also see the reluctance of facilities to want to find out what's going on, so there may be disincentives, but, and the incentives to m private medical providers is the goodwill they create in the community and helping out. And we literally had the head of Summit BMC sit here and say he'd be happy to work with us on some of this. So there's incentives. There's, I mean, that's, again, you're concluding no incentives. Another, a better way to phrase this is, you know, commissioners, do you think there would be any reasons private, you know, providers want to do it? Or do you think there's any reasons that these facilities might want to do this that we you know so that's the that's why we have a county commission is to talk about these kind of general overview issues so yeah i'm just trying to bring you up to speed on my thinking on this kind yeah, of the, Commissioner Anderson, that's great coaching i appreciate that um that's that's a good way for me to phrase it uh perhaps uh, since there's no time now i can certainly um, ask um, some of these questions at a later time uh, and, and yeah. seek your advice as to what financially incentives exist yeah. for the private sector to enter this market. For sure that I would appreciate your insight on that. Maybe we could bring it up. Maybe we could bring this up on Monday when we do have more time at our next meeting. I don't know what the other commissioners are no, feeling. I, but I definitely think we should bring it up because um, what yeah. Monday It'll be Wednesday. Our next meeting will be the following Wednesday. Monday is um, an AOC day for county commissioners. So, um, but I do think it's important, um, you know, Dr. Young clearly has a mobile clinic. She, you know, she feels that the need for testing and I believe, what is it, using LabCorp was the price for each test was like $100. So, you know, there are people out there that would be willing to step up and you know we just have to confirm that it's something that we could actually build the state for because on a, um, Nahad remember Washington County is getting a hundred million dollars they're only two and a half times bigger than us and we received less than a million we'll, we'll be receiving less than a million today with our first bill to the state 
Um, these are the CARES fund. It was $1.62 billion that the state of Oregon received. And if we need to do our long-term testing and really set the standard high um, for the employees and the people are vulnerable that live in those 33 facilities, I, I, think, it's, I think it's really important for us. Our record to date, um, thank you to our, our nurse that's been part of the team for the three counties for the last couple of years. She's done an outstanding job, an amazing job. Thank you, Carrie, for your work. It definitely has been um, appreciated and recognized by our board. Um, she's, she's done an amazing job. We, we don't want to have a problem in our vulnerable, and we've seen that in other parts of the state. So, you know, I think the money might be something that we can bill for through our CARES funding. And I, I would hate not to do that if we could um, implement that program. So let's, let's please look into it deeper next Wednesday, if not before, with individually with us. I think that makes sense, uh, Commissioner Adair. We can uh, set up uh, individual time as well as uh, sometime next Wednesday to uh, go into more details and, uh, and figure out a reasonable way forward. That sounds good. Well, we can also hear back from um, our finance director, Greg Munn, if that's something that we could actually bill for. And, you know, and we'll, we'll have all those answers, won't we, Tom? Certainly, commissioners, yeah. I, I, it's my understanding that anything that's clearly linked to COVID response is eligible for reimbursement under the act. So that's yeah, a good question to follow up. Thank you, yes. So for understanding the numbers, you mentioned uh, $500,000 uh, a week. Is that what it was, kind of the scope of the uh, uh, best practices testing? Commissioner DeVoe, this was, uh, like I mentioned, um, I, I did a very quick calculation based on number of staff and number of tests and how much those tests cost uh, to purchase and analyze. Based on that, um, uh, the the figures came to around half a million per week. That's if, for example, the county were to do it on its own, which was uh, not advised to me because the point was to work with our private sector to undertake this. Now, with the private sector, the first question that comes up is who's going to pay for this? That's what they've been asking us. Uh, who's going to pay for it? Yes, the goodwill is very important, um, uh, and, and that's something that certainly we can leverage. At the same time, um, some folks, uh, so the insurance companies haven't been forthright about doing serial testing uh, and paying for it. Um, they do if the person is symptomatic or advised by a doctor you know, based on uh, their exposure, but not necessarily for uh, healthy individuals. Um, so that, there is that issue that needs to be uh, considered. If the financial piece is uh, is uh, taken care of and the financial incentive is in place, uh, place uh, certainly it would uh, pull in the private sector to uh, lead this effort uh, with us uh, basically facilitating. Yep, understood. So, but I mean, that's so starting at five hundred thousand. How can you whittle that down? How can we get different partners to uh, participate with us? Uh, and as the Commissioner Dare said, how could we uh, bail it back to somebody? <laughs> well, right. it's the funds that we should, you know. But, I mean, that gives us a scope of what we're talking about. And then, the, you know, if we can get testing down to, uh, you know, the $15 for a, you know, a quick test or something, you know, that, that's the future also. Of course, of course. And that's why, for example, one of the first um, element, uh, one of the first issues that we tried to unpack a bit was uh, – how can we work with the long-term care facilities so that they actually take this on themselves yep. and manage the cost internally? And yep. one of the long-term care facilities, in fact, I believe it's in Bend, uh, is doing it on around 15 to 20% of their um, staff, I, I believe just staff, I'm not sure if they're residents too, and they're eating the cost or absorbing the cost uh, themselves, um, which, which is, I think, um, a, a very sensible way forward, yeah. Yep. Okay. Well, uh, so just to throw it out there, so District 2 meeting for next Tuesday. Have you guys heard about that? District 2 AOC. So I got contacted uh, as the district chair, but uh, there's going to be an email coming out. So the idea is each district of Association of Oregon Counties is going to meet next week and just start putting these lists of needs together and, you know, what's going on. Uh, so that's for next Tuesday afternoon, 3 to 4, June 9th. Uh, but 
you know, are this having, was. Are we having lunch at the High Desert Museum? I think it'll be an online one. Oh, well, I <laughs> online heard, meeting. I remember it last year. So okay, three to four. Next but I was week. just informed, uh, as I say, during the budget committee, I got a phone call asking asking about that, and then uh, email just today confirming that next week. So as I say, for everything we do that could go to AOC to the governor's office, this will be a tool next week. Okay, great. The other thing we'd asked about on just your update um, is the what about testing just going forward generally the you know there was an uptick where it went to nine hundred thousand what what do you foresee there um, in the future what are you hearing from the different medical providers or uh, Commissioner Anderson sorry are you talking about the testing rate or or what I'm sorry I didn't quite catch it just I'm curious about them. Uh, amount of testing going on how much you know we have somewhere in this I don't know what page it's on you had a chart showing the testing per week and you know the highest it got was almost a thousand but it, it looks like, yes but it's gone down since then and uh, so is it going to continue to go down or what do you what are you seeing there what are you hearing from the medical providers if anything right yeah uh, yes so this is I put the slide on the screen right now uh, th so first of all, uh, Commissioner, there's some there's a delay in the information that we receive. Uh, uh, basically, once the test is done and the results come back, then it goes into Orpheus or in this uh, electronic system. Uh, so there's a delay, and the numbers probably will change every time you know we present them. You'll see the prior week the numbers would have changed. Uh, so we don't have necessarily all the uh, data for 5:25 to 5:30 one week available. So that's that's the point there. Um, I think anything over 600 per week, which was the standard uh, communicated before, um, is, is, uh, is fairly reasonable. Uh, sometimes it goes higher, sometimes it goes lower because of, for example, if there's a case or a cohort of cases, and then the contact trace, uh, the contacts who are identified would have to be tested. So that increases the number. So to some extent, it could reflect the cases that we um, are observing as well. But anything over 600 seems to be reasonable. Of course, we want it to be uh, higher, um, but uh, at the same time, uh, there is going to be variation. Well, I, Red, I'm, not, I'm not really asking, I'm not complaining about anything. I'm just saying, what if only, I'm kind of wondering, so it's dropped from 995 to 687 in two weeks. Is that, I would assume that's because less people are reporting they want to be tested or so what happens if only 200 people show up at medical providers in a week that think they're sick from it? Or are we going to go find 400 more people? Or what's the plan to do that? The providers have any plan on that? Because that, to me, is a real possibility. Yeah, it it it's, it it could it could happen. Generally, uh, if we see the demand side of this, basically, if we have the supplies available but the demand side is not there or it's going down. Then one way to address this is is to modify the criteria for testing, um, and and maybe increase um, um, the reach to um, those who um, who are who are healthy and uh, in vulnerable settings and what have you to uh, meet those targets. So there are different ways uh, uh, to uh, as supply becomes more available to um, increase the reach. One of which is uh, modifying. Uh, uh, the criteria for testing, Commissioner. No, Nahad, but what about the 650 t people that were just tested th through Oregon State? Um, is that going to be added to the 687? Commissioner, are you referring to the long-term care facilities? No, or? I'm talking about the weekend testing last weekend, which Oregon State did uh -huh. in partnerships with our health, public health, where they went door-to-door -door in Bend. Um, yeah. Is that number going to be added to the 687? It seems like Dr. Conway is there, so maybe he can chime in. Uh, yes, when the test when the test results are available, uh, they will be added, um, and I'm I'm prepared to give a, a brief overview of the trace study. But shouldn't that the fact that the tests okay? You're saying because we don't have the results yet, the tests aren't added. So as Mr. Zodi said, not all of the results for uh, through the 31st would necessarily have been available at this juncture. Okay. We, um, Dr. Conway, we have a press conference in like six minutes. So 
Did you do you need do you want to take some time right now then? Did you want to Sure, I can I can probably cover that. It's because there's there's no results this year. I can probably cover it if you want. Is that all right with you, Nahad? Or do you have Please go ahead. Okay. So um Trace, as I've mentioned briefly in these meetings before, stands for team team based rapid assessment of community level corona epidemics. Uh, it's an Oregon State University public health project to determine the prevalence in communities. Um, they were, uh, it will inform a more effective response to COVID-19. Um, the results are also inform public health decision making. It's among the first types of studies like this. It's been piloted and then implemented in Corvallis, Benton County uh, over the last few weeks. Um, it will tell us uh, the systematic sample. It will tell us some idea of how frequently asymptomatic individuals may actually have COVID infection. Um, thanks to uh, OSU, based on a request that I made about a month ago, thanks to OSU and Pacific Source Foundation funding, Trace did come to uh, Bend uh, last weekend, the 30th and 31st. Um, they brought uh, 30 vans, uh, 30 teams of people, and sampled in 30 neighborhoods, inviting households to participate. Um, they tested uh, over uh, 600 people. They, the person swabbed themselves after getting information and signing consent. Uh, we're awaiting results and analysis. We expect to have results available to share publicly by the middle of next week. In the interim, any uh, positive cases would be uh, followed up per usual by our communicable disease team. Uh, there's also wastewater testing being done in parallel for certain subsites as a correlation, and that may be a harbinger more that we can do in the future. For example, at long-term care facilities, as, as Mr. Zodi mentioned. Uh, that data will probably take longer, maybe the end of next week, uh, because of the, some complicated uh, analytic um, process. That's, that's all I have. Okay. Oh, thank you, Dr. Conway. Did you have any questions for him? No, thank you. Looking forward to seeing those results. Um, um, Nahad, you did have a, a couple of slides on environmental health. The fact that they are uh, distributing face shields, um, they're having facility inspections, which is great, and then we have five new mobile food trucks being reviewed. So that's excellent to hear. Yes, Commissioner, I am, I'm glad you uh, are going through the slides, uh, and uh, I'm glad you're highlighting this. Thank you. Well, the environmental health department has done an outstanding job reaching out to the community. I hear um, excellent feedback regarding their help and it's truly appreciated. So um, thank you very much. So I see that we have the plea to our community to use physical distancing, wash your hands. We actually came up with, it should be, your hands should be clean and, um, and you're highlighting in red to wear a mask. Yes, Commissioner. The next slide shows that Oregon is amongst the uh, states with the lowest uh, mask usage. Um, and uh, there are, <laughs> I don't, maybe I, I don't, I'm not sure how to, uh, um, how to explain that other than, other than to say that I get it. I, I realize that it's not part of our culture or social norms compared maybe to some of the Asian countries, and it's probably not the most convenient thing or the coolest thing either. Um, and, I, and I realized there was some confusion around mask usage um, early on. Uh, so I get all those uh, points. At the same time, we know a lot more now. We know how the virus is uh, transmitted. It's you know, through breathing and talking and coughing and sneezing. So it's not just droplets, but also aerosol. And we also know through some studies that uh, wearing masks significantly reduces this virus from um, infecting us. So my plea to the community and everyone is uh, uh, really to um, uh, respect and protect uh, each other, our businesses and our community. Our businesses will suffer if this virus starts to circulate again uh, um, in our community at high numbers. 
and affect uh, consumer confidence. So for protecting um, our businesses and our community, I really plead to our um, uh, community members to uh, consider wearing masks. Over. Oh. So I, uh, I had a question yesterday about uh, is phase two mean we can not wear masks? So we need to get real clear on that. Uh, as I say, it was just a question out of the blue, and I said no uh, in discussions with uh, Dr. George, uh, you know, the concept of wearing a mask may be appropriate for the next year or so, whatever the kind of the scope of this is, uh, to be more socially accepted. But, uh, yeah, the clear statement that phase two doesn't mean masks are optional. And I really appreciate you saying that, Nahad, and I we encourage people to have fun with them, create interesting ones. Uh, at the high school yesterday, uh, the person that was wait we were waiting with had, was the music teacher, and her friend had made a mask with all the music notes on it and things. And I think that's we should just do that. I, I totally agree with what you're saying. Thank you, Commissioner Henderson. Thank you. I'm sorry. Uh, please, my apologies to Tom. I didn't mean to take so much time. My apologies to all of you and messing up your agenda. I, I, I just appreciate how interested and caring you are about this uh, issue and uh, continuously appreciate your um, support. No, thank you so much. And sorry that we let Republic go ahead of you. It wasn't intentional. But um, thank you, Nahad, for your presentation today. So we're actually well, going to next week. We look forward to a more deeper discussion next week. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So at this moment in time, I believe we are going to head to the press conference. And we're in recess, right? we are recessing to the press conference and then we'll uh, be picking up. So we're again. watching the governor's press conference. Yes, the, the governor. Our governor. Not is our press conference. No, it's the governor's. Yeah. Yes, I do want to reconvene our meeting to let you know that we will be breaking now for lunch. Um, our meeting will um, be available online again at 1 p.m. today, so please join us back at 1 p.m. We do have some public hearing, a public hearing on our agenda at that time. So 1 p.m., thank you so much. We're um, ending our... Commissioner's meeting for Deschutes County, um, June 3rd, 2020. And our next ag agenda item, which is actually number 12, uh, consideration of county administrator's signature of policy. Um, Kathleen, would you like to join us, please? Hello. Hello. Okay, good. You can hear me. Um, so there's We've, we've had our policy, um, our, um, let's see, it's the Finance One Health Benefits Fund policy for a while. And so um, I think there's been a lot of discussion about reevaluating that policy. And so that's really kind of the, the history of why it's coming to you again today. Um, what I'd like to, um, present to the board or what's here is really the start or the discussion. There's been a lot of internal work on completing the um, policy. And what exists here is a change from the old policy to the new policy. The old policy was one paragraph and really just set a limit in terms of um, it should be a uh, 12, 12 months worth of claims. The new policy, the plan, um, the change really is that we're establishing two identifying two reserves within the fund. Um, the first reserve would include a our claims liability, which our claims liability is that legal limit. So the piece um, that is um, the piece that we have to, the reserve that we have to keep um, legally for our self-funded plan. Um, and that is really made up of looking at claims that we have incurred, but maybe not paid yet and it's a timing structure and we do use an external consultant for that valuation. Um, and that number, uh, just to kind of give an idea, it's evaluated every quarter. Um, the When we looked at it, uh, the last quarter it came back at about 1.9 uh, million as our 
bottom line must have this in reserves to be compliant with um, ORS statutes around self-funding. When we looked at what that included in terms of the claims liability reserve, um, you know, we have a lot of um, items or uh, tools that we use to manage our self-funding, which includes like our doc services, our online, our on-site clinic and our on-site pharmacy. And so taking into account that component of uh, the plan, which does not contribute directly to claims, but there's cost associated with administering those programs. Um, the recommendation is that our claims liability reserve be set at uh, 1.5 uh, times our that legal valuation. And that's a recommendation that comes from, uh, is supported by our benefit consultants uh, who are actually the ones who do our claims valuation there. The second piece of the reserve policy includes um, a contingency reserve. And this would be the amount of funds that we would are recommending to put in there to address you know, some of the volatility that exists with our claims um, to manage uh, the what could be sort of high spikes in terms of um, costs for departments uh, if we're to react it, it essentially provides a cushion for us to react to high claims tiers, for instance and not have to react by increasing department charges um, in direct relation to those high cost claims years um, but so that we can maintain that or smooth that over those years and that's really uh, that is being recommended to to match the uh, the claims liability reserve. So if we were to look at current numbers, for instance, what came back in March, we'd be looking at about 5.7 or 5.9 million as being the minimum in the reserve based on this policy. The is idea that, is that is that two times, is that twice the claims re revenue then or, or correct, reserve? Correct. So it's. So it's two point, uh, what'd you say, 5.7? About 5.7, 5.9. It'd be more than, or less than half of what it is now. Correct. <laughs> and, and I would identify that that's a minimum. The idea is um, that, or the plan would be that the budget committee and the board um, would have some ability to impact where or identify where the claims, uh, the health benefit fund total sits to maybe address certain things like, I don't know, projects or the volatility of some of the claims, uh, the risk comfort um, that the board or budget committee have there. Great. So that claims reserve calculated number is the key to the whole thing because then you take that times 1.5 and then double it. <laughs> That's how you get into 5.7 or 5.9? That's the magical formula you've identified there, yes. Go. It is. You know, we we this is actually something that we worked back uh, this exact policy with Wayne on our previous, uh, you know, finance director and we looked at you know where we thought the uh, reserve should be, um, and you know from a financial aspect, he came up with about four or five million. Um, what the the work that HR did was to come up with the um, sort of the, the reasons why it should be about that, and then identifying sort of our legal requirements, and then what the fund would would do with that contingency reserve, um, or what it's intended to do. So then this policy really isn't, aren't those numbers, those are the numbers that are the proposed starting point once this policy is in place. Right, so the idea is that it wouldn't be less than that. And actually, I think it's kind of interesting and ironic that today we're talking about this, whereas on our consent agenda was the fact that we moved a budget adjustment of two million into this past um, fiscal year, which is ending up the 30th of June. Correct. Yes. Right. Because of our costs were higher than we had seen um, on a, you know, on the past, what, a historical basis? Correct. So this is one of the years where we have those high cost claims. Um, 
when when you look at that in the terms of when you're looking at stop loss or or high uh, claims costs, there tends to be a five year um, kind of average that you look at, and you expect one of those years to be higher. Um, th you know that's that's on a, a well managed or good plan, right? Is that the idea that you're you're only seeing one year of high cost claims, and when you average that over the five years um, is when you ideally have um, a more stable um, rate increase, for instance, annually. And that's really what we're looking at. So we're in that year. We're in the year where we have higher cost claims than anticipated. So so I, I get what we're doing here. Um, you know, it looks like it's the amount of that, the, the half of the 5.7 or 5.9 is, you know, 2.8 or whatever it's, 2.85 to 9.5. That's about, I think our net annual claims are about 18 million or something, aren't they? Or 16, somewhere in there. Um, that we're paying. The cost of our, yes, right. Yeah. So our claims are around 14 to 16. And this year's a higher one. So we're Correct. getting, yeah. Um, well, I was looking back. So when the policy was set, was 2006, which was the, we were in the middle of a very big boom, so we probably had a lot of um, resources back then, a lot of money back then. So, we're, so a year's sounds pretty like let's put a year aside. I don't think I would go down this low. I'd put a couple million on top of this if, was, if I was just doing it off the cuff here, just because of a year like this year, just as an issue. But. Uh, I get where, and it, there's a value of going down because they we're not making much money on this money anyway. If, it'd be better if we were making 5% or 7% on our money, but what are we probably making 1% or something, one and a half. So what, why, why don't we just do this? What, what's the whole, is, do we need to evaluate it more or are we being asked to do it today or? Um, yeah. There is, um, consideration for either direction to adjust the policy, uh, more requests work from HR or finance, or if the board is ready, can um, provide the uh, approval for um, county administrator signature. So there, there is one sense of timing with this, and, and it, as the board knows, we've been talking about a, a set policy for quite a few years now. And the good news with this is that it uh, this will, that gap, bringing down the gap between wherever you set the policy and where it is now uh, buys us a lot of cushion over the next three, four, five or years or longer to keep our health care premiums to departments, which is a labor cost down. So that's, that's a definite good news. But the timing issue that comes into play here, you may recall um, last year, Black Butte Ranch Service District uh, asked of the board if um, we would entertain the idea of them becoming part of our self-insured health plan. And the board direction last year was to go ahead and have discussions with them and, and talk to them about that. Um, there is the question of a buy-in amount. In other words, to bring them onto the plan, they would need to contribute an amount uh, equivalent to our reserve so that other, our, res our existing reserve doesn't begin paying for their claims, uh, particularly if they have a large claim right out of the gate. So we were waiting to, for the board to, to set a, a policy amount so that we could provide a accurate, if you will, number to Black Butte Ranch Service District for what their buy-in amount would be. Uh, it's, it's artificially high if we base their buy-in amount on the existing year, level. Yeah. But if we can peg that by an amount to what the board believes is the appropriate reserve amount, that brings down their by an am amount, amount that's appropriate for their, their um, anticipated claims. And again, this would not be for their sworn officers. This would be for their management staff and office staff. So um, that, uh, you know, setting this policy will allow us to resume those discussions with Black Butte and we'd obviously bring it back to the board before we, we finalized anything, but that would uh, uh, that would allow us to move forward. Okay. Well, I, um, so is this when the system started, or we self-insured was 2006, or was it before that? It was before that, wasn't it? Uh, Correct. 
Yeah, I'm not sure the exact date was in roughly that time frame. I was just thinking, having now worked with Mike Meyer on the budget committee for several years, watched it. I can see when they set it up, they said, "Well, how much do we put as a reserve?" And we said, "Well, let's gonna do a year's." <coughs> I can see how we got here without maybe. I mean, I'm just speculating, but I. Um, and back then, interest rates were higher. I think, as I remember, but. Um, but it doesn't make sense to have a lot of money sitting when you're not making any money on it. It's, I mean, it's reassuring, but it doesn't, it's not like you're getting ahead, so. Well, then uh, the discussion at the annual budget process will be set up for next year, too, because we're kind of making our commitments to what we're going to do this year. We're going to have reserves. It's in place right now. So it's really a, a future discussion about, you know, is, is that, um, you know, 5.7 to 9 million, the right number, or do we feel more comfortable a little higher, or, you know, that'd be a budget discussion. It'd be a little bit different next year, knowing that we have policy's four, different. Yeah. So we have 14 years of experience now, and that the full year reserve has been pl plenty adequate, right? We've never had a year when it was way more than adequate. Way more than adequate. So I. Well, I probably feel about comfortable coming down, but I don't think I want to go this low myself. If, since oh yeah, well I don't I don't know that we're making that statement by you know adopting this policy. The words are to be determined on what what we really want to use the numbers are because the numbers aren't published in here. These are just the suggested starting point numbers. Correct. I mean, well, one point yeah, five this sets a policy. It doesn't include numbers, but it the result of the formula in the policy would establish a number. Um, and as Kathleen said, it would be about 5.9 million. And I'm I'm fine if the board believes that, you know, oh. they, they'd be more comfortable with a little bit more in there. But that what that suggests, though, is that we change the formula somewhat, to uh, result in a little bit higher number, so that we can then adopt the policy and and move forward on those yeah. other things. So, so oh. I'm looking at the last. Sorry, the last sentence. The actual, actual amount of the contingency reserve shall be established during the annual budget process and will be set to allow for the above consideration. So I'm just thinking it gives you the opportunity to do something variable with that. The contingency reserve. And it really defines the, instead of, oh, the big, the big pool of dollars is just one year of claims, now we're saying, okay, there's a claims reserve calculated one and a half times is the goal. Contingency reserve was start at one and a half times, and then where do you want to take it after that? So, but I, so I, I see what you're saying about the budget process, but I don't really want to sit in the budget meetings and discuss it that much about well, how much should we set aside this year? If because it becomes more complicated, I'd like to go into it knowing that it's it's almost like an item C that on top of the contingency reserve will be another 50% of the total of the contingency and this or something. So it's kind of set and then the actual number is resolved with the budget committee if we want to put something else, but not, I mean, I'd like it to be higher, I think, to begin with, I think, somewhat. So, so we're not spending a lot of time as if all of us have to have an opinion about it every year. I don't know, that's my... Well, and is that what you're saying or not? But there's another remember. scenario here. I th I'm seeing this thing slowly go down. I mean, we're not going to spend a reserve down in one or two years, maybe three, four, or five years, whatever the number is. So then it's that day that you say, okay, we're at our maximum. Health for, and I don't know how fast it'll happen. It could be two, three, four, five years. You mean years. we'll be at our minimum, not our maximum? Uh, if we're going down to reserve. The we're, we're, we're at our minimum reserves. Cost of health care is going up, so now we need to increase charges to the departments. My point is that's a few years away, having to increase charges to departments, and that's where you need to start having that conversation. So I don't see it as a big debate or discussion for the first, the next few well, years. Yeah, we're still at, what are we right now, to 12 or 14? 14. Kathleen, where did the 1.5 come from, though, that, that calculation um, number? <coughs> So the 1.5 times is really to account for, uh, we, we looked at the cost. If, if we, coming up with that claims liability, we look at if tomorrow we decided to become fully insured and close down all of our um, self-insured programs. And so where would, where would that 
what would that cost uh, be to the county, right? And so we looked at, we have that claims liability, which um, that valuation comes into account, just takes into account the claims themselves. So then there are all the additional, um, there's the run out, our um, administrative contracts with, you know, uh, a TPA, et cetera, and then um, doc services, um, kind of the, the run out of closing that out. And that's where that 1.5 comes from. So the idea with that, that claims liability is if for some reason tomorrow we determined that we're not going to be self-insured anymore, we'll be fully insured either by choice or because we're being required to do so, right? Um, that's that's what that cost is, and that's why we put that aside. Um, the second light or the second reserve then is really for that adding that flexibility to allow us to adjust for some of the volatility that we experience in claims. Yeah, so I mean, I don't know that we need to throw out a number right now. You know, Commissioner Henderson, you're saying a little bit more, but is is do we yeah, need to? Do, I mean, this is a policy that could be brought up at any time to say, okay, now the policy is in place. Let's talk about the contingency reserve and what we feel comfortable <laughs> with. Um, what one option for you is uh, the way the policy reads now is that the uh, the contingency reserve or the, the the reserve amount shall be the sum of the claim year plus the contingency reserve at the same amount. So you could say 125% of the claims or of the contingency reserve or 150% to build that into the formula. So that would get you an extra 50% or an actual tw extra 25% of the total amount as the formula to calculate, as a starting point to calculate the annual reserve. Yeah, I like that. I like that. So that would that would be a change in two places in the policy in the, on page two the contingency reserve the fourth line down where it says same value instead of same value you'd say either 125 or 150 percent of the value of the claims reserve oh. and then you yeah I like that okay. personally that's, it makes that's, me feel better which that's fine as you say I'm, I wasn't opposed to having that conversation. I just didn't know if we'd be putting it in this document right now. So uh, I'm under contingency reserve item number four. Is that what you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, uh, two places. The first one on number, letter B, fourth line down where it says same value. Oh, the fourth line. Yeah, okay. You'd put uh, either 125 or 150% yep. of the claims reserve. And then you'd need to do it again down in the in the second to last line would say the sum amount of the claims reserve and that whatever percentage uh, of the contingency reserve. Yeah. And Kathleen, check me if I'm. Oh, you're, you're right on. And just another note is that that, that valuation, so over the course of a year, you know, I said it's 1.9 right now. It's about where our, our, the claims valuation amount is. Um, you know, it was 2.2 about this time last year. Um, I and we had were this is a look back, um, and so we do have kind of a lower, even though we had a big year, um, based on when this is looking at claims. The claims are a little bit lower. If my, I anticipate that as we move forward, we may see an increase to that claims liability, that valuation <laughs> amount. We may back, be back into that 2.2. Um, and if that's the case, that 5.7 or 5.9 will likely be closer to 6.4 or 6.5. So it, the idea with the policy is that it is built so that it does reflect some of the volatility, right? Adjusting the reserve to address some of that vol claims volatility we see. If it's not as as comfortable as it, the board, you know, um, is is willing to go in terms of risk, I, I think Tom's idea is a great one in terms of, you know, 150%, 125%. And actually you wouldn't need to change it in the bottom paragraph because it just talks about the sum of the of them both, claims reserve and contingency reserve, and oh, we yeah. find what 
contingency reserve is okay. already up above. So just, just change it to one spot. place. Yeah, I'm not opposed to that. I mean, I was just throwing out ideas. So basically, generally, $2 million claims reserve. And you, uh, Kathleen mentioned a little bit below or a little bit above. $2 million buffer uh, is the cost of doing business comfortably and then $2, $2 million on top of that. So, I mean, just that's the way I'm seeing it. You know, it's like we are still very conservative in these funds, which is wonderful. Two million on top of that would actually be double the claims reserve as your reserve contingency. Two hundred percent, wouldn't it? Yeah. As opposed to one hundred fifty. Yeah. Oh, I was referring to the one and a half times that end up being. Uh, yeah, because we're actually, yeah, we're actually concept. closer to three and three right now, and and so we're going to be another one and a half million or something. That's what you're saying if we do. Uh, and that's fine. One hundred fifty percent. One hundred fifty percent. One hundred fifty. Right. Please. So we, we might be able to put this to bed if we want to just say with proposed edits. Yeah. We need a motion. Yeah. So I'll move a, uh, approval of um, or. Yeah, County Administrator Signature of Policy F-13, Reserve Policy for Health Benefits Fund, as amended by changing the words in item B from same value to 150%. Yes. Is there a second? I'll second it. Further discussion? Well, you know, and one other just advisory thing, I hopefully we can do it in-house rather than having a, have to hire a consultant every year to come up with that number because it's kind of a round number anyway. It seems like there's some formula we could use somehow, but I don't know what that is. But to pay, I don't know what it costs for a consultant to do it. It'd be great if we could do it ourselves. Well, okay. So Commissioner Anderson? Yeah. I vote yes. Commissioner Devon? Yes. Chair votes yes. And this just actually reminded me of a bill I submitted to our insurance company the 1st of March that is still out there circling the planet. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay, keep March, circling. April, May. Yeah. Two and a half months. Oh. Yeah, two and a half months. I'm like, oh, well. Okay. Um, but Kathleen, were you going to say something about the consultant? You? Oh, I just wanted to let you know that it is part of the, um, you know, we have a consultant on our benefits plan, and that is a, component of the contract. Um, so it's not anything that we call out special. It's it's just part of what they do there. Um, if we were to ever not use a consultant, I would absolutely, you know, uh, look internally and discuss whether or not that's something that we could take on. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, we're ready for Holly Harris. <clears throat> there she is. Can you hear me now? We sure can. Okay, hi. Hello. I'm Holly Harris, Program Manager with Health Services. And I believe Randy Schroyer is also on the line at the District Attorney's Office. Okay, um, so I'm here today to request approval to apply for the IMPACTS grant. Um, this is, as you remember, we talked about, we've been kind of following this grant um, since last year. This uh, is a grant coming out from the Oregon Criminal Justice Commission, um, and it was based on the passage of Senate Bill 973, which essentially created a behavioral health justice reinvestment program. Um, IMPACT stands for Improving People's Access to Community-Based Treatment, Supports, and Services. Um, and their target population is really individuals with a behavioral health disorder or disorders 
who have been booked into jail four more times on average in a year um, or are high utilizers of the criminal justice system, state hospital system, and hospital systems. So as uh, we've kind of talked about over this past year, I've been eyeballing this grant for some time, waiting for it to come out, because um, I really feel like the Stabilization Center fits squarely um, in the purview of this grant. So I'm here today to request approval to apply for the grant. Um, it's, it is a two-year grant, um, and we are requesting uh, to apply for a little over $2.5 million for the two-year period. Um, and the goal would really be to get the Stabilization Center to be operational 24-7, 365 days a year for the two-year period. Um, and in addition to that piece, uh, which I think the grant it specifically called out supporting Stabilization Center, so I think um, it's, a, it's a good um, thing to focus on with this particular grant. But we also wanted to focus on our aid and assist um, situation here in Deschutes County, we've seen a 425% increase in our aid and assist population, which as you know, these are individuals that have been charged with a crime that um, because of their serious mental illness are unable to aid and assist their attorney in their own defense. And they end up staying in jail longer than the average person, often for very low level crimes, decompensate, um, have to go to the state hospital for what they call restoration. Um, only then to come back and have to deal with their charges. So it's it's not only awful for the individual going through that system and, and um, doesn't provide very good outcomes for them, but it also is a massive drain on resources locally within our jail, our district attorney's office, um, and just our criminal justice system as a whole. So um, if Brandy is on the line, I, I'd love her to talk about what we how we're planning to address that with this grant. Oh, there she is. Hi. Um, good afternoon, commissioners. This is um, Brandi Schroyer from the Deschutes County District Attorney's Office. And over the last year, um, I think the kind of interesting thing about this grant was the Deschutes, um, our office was also um, contacted by the commission and um, they sought us out and said that they thought we would be good candidates to apply for the grant. And then Holly and I met, um, not realizing we had both been eyeing the same grant and decided that we wanted to figure out a way that we could best work together because um, that was one of the other things that the commission is really encouraging is a collaborative approach um, and so in addressing the stabilization center realizing how much um, benefit that that's going to provide to the community like holly said we've also seen that there is um, a bit of a gap when we are dealing with the population of people who have severe and persistent mental illness. So what we have come up with and what we think is a nice complement both to the Stabilization Center, to the grant and to our community is um, a FACT team and FACT stands for Forensic Assertive Community Treatment. And with that team and the grant, we are looking to get a case manager and a peer and those individuals would work with our target population um, through the research development on this grant. We've um, identified roughly 500 individuals that meet the grant criteria. And what we would be doing is if those people came through the criminal justice system and were cited for criminal charges, we would use the case manager and the peer to engage them in community services over a period of time. And if they willingly engaged, then the dist district attorney's office would not file on those low level misdemeanors. So we identified just a small handful of crimes that this would apply to. Again, they're all low level misdemeanors, um, but it would address a large population of high utilizers. So people that are coming through the criminal justice system, using um, behavioral health, using the emergency department, and our goal ultimately is to, birth, to, to divert them out of the criminal justice system, offer them community services, build that community network for them going into the future. And ultimately by keeping them out of the system, we're keeping them out of the jail and we're also keeping them out of the aid and assist process in the state hospital. Um, so we're hoping that we are successful um, with the full amount of the grant so that we can utilize both components of that program and address um, some of the gaps that we're seeing in our community. Brandy, um, what is the deadline that this application needs to be in? I couldn't find it. And I know the funding can start the 1st of July. 
right? It's June 12th. But, okay, so, so they, next week. And very, then they're gonna... very slow to just quick. Yes. So, okay. And a question about the application. Is it, is it a joint commit, uh, criminal justice commission and Oregon Health Authority application, or what, what is it? Who are we applying to specifically? So it's actually going to be the Oregon Criminal Justice Commission. Um, Oregon Health Authority, um, they've collaborated on the RFP and the Grant Review Committee, and they'll be um, part of the process for approving the applications, but the actual money is flowing through the Criminal Justice Commission. Um, and it's important to note also that technically the application, um, the applicant for this grant is LIPSIC, so the Local Public Safety Coordinating Council, um, but because of how we're, we're planning to um, go about the funding, the funding would actually flow through health services, which is why we're here before you asking for approval to apply. Um, but it's it's kind of a strange application in that they're asking LIPSIC to be the ones to apply. LIPSIC's already endorsed this project. Um, and so we've, we've already gone through that process. So one question I had, um, Holly, was we're, we're applying for a quarter of what the state's willing to to do unless it's um, 10 million per year and then we're only at 10th but um, I don't know one is it likely they'd give a quarter of the funds to one entity and then what are we gonna do if they give us half that or how does that yeah. change the that's a great question Commissioner um, and it's certainly one that Brandy and I've talked about a lot it I mean I think from I've attended almost every grant review committee meeting since last year really trying to get a sense of what types of projects they're looking to fund, whether, you know, this would make sense to go after. Um, and and from what I'm hearing, and obviously nothing's guaranteed, but they, it sounded like they're kind of looking to fund a couple of key projects that, if they're successful, could be rolled out across the state if they're good models for how to do things. But they wanted some kind of different, unique types of projects. And so I think I kind of got the sense that they're looking to fund, you know, three to five projects statewide. Um, and they've talked a lot about models like ours um, that, um, that they think will be successful and that could be emulated in other communities. There is a real possibility we don't get the full 2.5 million and Brandy and I've talked about that. So I think um, if we don't get the full amount, um, we may not be able to do the aid and assist portion of the project. We may not be able to fully be 24 seven, but we would be able to expand hours even further than what we're currently able to do. So we'll sort of have to wait and see if we're awarded, what amount we're awarded, and then what we would be able to do with that money. Um, Randy, do you have anything to add to that? No, I agree. I mean, we've kind of processed at varying levels what what phases we can implement and what we can't. Um, but at the end, we decided to go for the full amount that we wanted, and then we'll just work backwards if we have to. But we've definitely considered all of that, and we're, we're prepared um if we don't get all the money what would a um an aid and assist um a person that's employed helping with aid and assist what would that person be doing and um how many people will that person be able to work with at a given time so to speak i don't know much about sure. aid and assist yeah, I would actually kind of think about it like our forensic diversion team. Um, so we've come before you a number of times talking about the success of that team. And that that's a heavily peer based model. So individuals with lived life experience that have been through much of these types of situations themselves because of their mental illness or substance use disorder, they're able to kind of walk alongside folks in a way that kind of traditional therapy isn't always able to do. They can connect with them on a, on a real life personal basis. Um, they have a tremendous success rate with being able to engage clients that are difficult to engage. Um, and then the case management portion of things really helps them kind of get through those barriers that are keeping these folks kind of bogged down in the system, getting them on their OHP, which is a big part of this grant as well, getting them um, housing resources, food boxes, just basic needs met. And so by having the combination of the peer and the case manager, we're really able to just connect with them in a way that just sending them to an appointment for therapy for this particular population isn't always the most successful way to go about things. But Does that answer your question? Well, it's, yeah, part of it. Um, but so the the aid and assist component of a program like of this program would be, and I see one peer uh, support specialist listed as a new employee is, or are some of these behavioral health specialists also 
aid and assist people? No, the only aid and assist staff that we're looking to hire is the case uh, behavioral health specialist one and then the peer support specialist. And the other staff that are listed are to support the 24 seven operations of the stabilization center. Those oh, really? It's that. roughly, I don't know, a third or less of the, of the work would go to aid and assist. And you're saying if you got less funds, you might not do as much of that and you do more of the stabilization. Okay. Correct. And I was thinking aid and assist also was with defense of a, on a criminal charge. That's not, we're not doing any of that. Or, I mean, I was wondering why the oh, I, DA's office is involved. Um, if it's all about mental health or behavioral health. So. So commissioner, I, um, this is Brandy again from the DA's office. And I think that that aid and assist is sort of the, the population that we're um, hoping to avoid creating um, because kind of an, and somebody who is unable to aid and assist um, once they get into the criminal justice system creates a, um, it, it, there's just a lot of cost and time associated with that. So what our hope is that if we get the full funding we can put a case manager and a peer on a fact team, so a forensic team that is helping to divert those individuals out of the criminal justice process so they don't become part of an aid and assist group in the criminal justice system. So the idea is to divert them um, before we even get to that point. And, and the reason the DA's office is so critical to that is because these individuals would have already been cited with some type of crime. And so it's, it would be the DA's office have, being willing to drop, to not file those charges um, so that they don't end up in the aid and assist process. And they are willing to do that if we have some criteria for how to, if, for when these folks are engaged with the behavioral health system. So we've come up with some criteria of, you know, they'll meet with the case manager and the peer weekly. They will attend four treatment appointments. They'll attend a medication appointment. And if they do those things within a 180 day period, the DA's office is willing to not file those charges and not have them enter the criminal justice system at all. What What were the, thanks, that, I understand what you're saying there. Uh, what is, you, you made the, through, gave us the number 475% increase in aid and assist. Um, from what, I mean, was from the, 2019 number or the 2010 number or 2017 it's so, actually 425 isn't it that's what the letter said 425 percent i believe what uh 425 percent increase uh, since 2017 in our aid and assist population so so uh and that how many were in 2017 if because you know 400 percent of two is 10 right but 20 is 100, so. Uh, let me pull, I can pull that up. I think we had like six in 2017. Um, if I'm not, if I'm remembering, I, these, are, these are estimates, Commissioner Henderson, because I don't have it directly in front of me, but I believe we're at like 42 now, which given that we don't get hardly any money from the state to actually manage this population, and we've had to absorb this work within um, teams, uh, it's, been, it's been a real challenge. And this population takes an enormous amount of time um, to what they call restore. It's weekly legal skills training. It's, you know, day, sometimes daily contact with these individuals to keep them out of further criminal justice system involvement. So they're an intense population. So when you're saying it's going from six to 42 or whatever it was, are you, um, are we just identifying more people as aid and assist or is the population that's being arrested changing? Brandy, I'll let you weigh in on that. I mean, do you, do you have a sense of kind of why it's exploded? Yeah, I'm, I don't know if, if just as individuals we're getting better at maybe identifying some of the, um, you know, some of the behaviors and some of the issues that we're seeing. Um, you know, we've done a lot of education in our community. Um, our civil commitment process involves one of the defense firms in town um, a few years back through an order from Judge Brady, we started appointing um, attorneys for every individual that was placed in the hospital and could undergo a civil commitment. Um, around the state, they usually don't appoint attorneys until about the third day when there's a decision that they're gonna go through commitment. 
So I think from that process, um, a lot of our civil bar has become more educated on things that they should be looking for and concerns to have when they're working with their defendants. Um, and I think a lot of it has also been legislative changes and how we um, process these cases. Uh, since March, the court has initiated an aid and assist docket. So every Monday from 9.30 to 11, we have um, cases that are being heard dealing with this population. And that's just because of legislative changes. There are some individuals who have to be heard in front of the court every seven days. So it when you think like about the amount of, oh, go ahead. Okay. so, and when you think about the amount of time that um, the court is now utilizing, we have one judge that deals with that. Um, I'm the prosecutor that usually handles that docket. There's multiple defense attorneys. So if you, and a lot of those crimes are lower level misdemeanors. And so if we look at a way to convert some of that population in the very beginning, before they even enter the criminal justice system, by identifying that they are one of these high utilizers in the system, by you know assigning them a case manager, or having them work with a peer and trying to get them connected with services in the community, and because that's generally the end goal is you're trying to help stabilize somebody and help them build a network, um, then you know that would be the goal of this program. And so exactly why the population has increased, I don't really know, um, but I think some of it is us getting better at identifying the issues. Um, but I also just think generally the population is definitely increasing. And I, I would also add to that too, just um, around the civil commitment, you touched on it a little bit, but over the course of um, the last five years or so, our civil commitment process um, has in my opinion, really uh, been an extreme challenge. So to get somebody to go through the civil process and commit them yeah. to the state hospital has become so difficult that many of these folks cannot be civilly committed and put in hospitals where they where they would be better suited, but instead are not committed and released to our community and then end up often committing crimes and end up in our criminal justice system. That's why things like the Stabilization Center are really so critical to a community to kind of fill that gap because the bar for civil commitment is so high. Okay. Yeah. I have a couple more questions. Go ahead. Yeah. Go well, ahead. I, I remember um, talking to the Oregon Criminal Justice Commission head. Is that Michael? Is that correct? Anyway, last November, and I remember that he said Deschutes County was in an excellent position for this. So, unfortunately, it has taken, what, six months, seven months in order to get where we are. But uh, I do want to thank you for all your work. I did have one question. Uh, Regarding the aid and assist, you have a statement in here that you've, we've, Deschutes County has seen a 60, 67% increase in those referrals. From what point in time? Is that from 17 to now? Yes, I believe it is. Okay, Sorry, so you're, you're matching. Okay. Go ahead, Commissioner Henderson. Well, does Commissioner Brown, do you have any nope. questions? Okay. So, um, two other questions kind of subjects one is uh, so are the emergency room referrals also avail able to be this part of this population or is it just criminal justice related? yes it's um they originally when this grant and when the legislation was passed they were really specific on it being four or more times booked into jail we had, they had a lot of pushback from communities like deschutes county who do a really really good job of trying to keep people out of our jail um, and we really wanted to be able to focus also on high utilizers of law enforcement time out in the community, as well as emergency department utilization, because those are all intertwined. So they did broaden the target population to include that. So the emergency department could be used, utilize yes. it. Well, one, I think I've said this at other means, I'll just say it again. I, I really think a key factor with that emergency department is, so, is <coughs> if we had funds like this, um, the transportation of just getting people from the hospital to the to the stabilization you know, center. And I almost I kind of visualize a system where we just have somebody sitting there every day, <laughs> the, the, the night shift, so to speak. I don't know, maybe the day shift. The police can do it easier, but I I don't know. That's just one comment, and if, I'm glad it is including that. The other is I just want to say, and I uh, I think I've given this caution before. When I see adding this many people, and I know. 
it seems like we've talked, every time we've talked about the Stabilization Center, we talk about this 24-7, but in the um, set, six Stabilization Centers that I visited in Oregon, uh, four of the five biggest counties, uh, Marion, uh, Lane, Clackamas, and Washington, as well as Jackson, which is, I guess, the sixth biggest, very, there's very little night business, so to speak, uh, in any of those. Some of them don't even operate in the night, to, you know, over the, you know, from late in the evening, like 10 or 11 at night till early morning. Uh, Lane and Marion were both kind of available, but they didn't have much staffing. So I'm, I'm just concerned that I know this has been the push here, and I just give a caution if I was, I mean, we just opened it, I guess, soft opening this week. I am cautioning hiring all the people and just having this full staff if we aren't getting the people. So I, I don't know when, if we get the money right away, we might want to save that till we see how it flows because maybe transportation is a big, bigger issue or whatever. But I just, that isn't what, what's going on in the other ones. Now I know when you guys uh, went and visited like Kansas City, they might, might be 24 seven, but you know, there's 4 million people in Kansas City probably or something. So I just, I'm worried about getting all this money and we're going to hire all these people and then is it really going to be full 24-7? So that's just my, because that hasn't been the pattern in other counties in the state of Oregon. And maybe we're doing it close enough to the, you know, but they aren't right next to the to the jail. They aren't, uh, they maybe don't have, maybe they're not as brave. In, in some of the more suburban counties, there's many cities, so they, I don't think they're utilized the same as Ben and Redmond might use them. but. I, I'm just putting that caution out there. Well, and I appreciate the comment, Commissioner, and it's certainly something we'll be monitoring, obviously, very, very closely and collecting data on. Um, and I do think Deschutes County is a, is a little bit unique from a lot of counties and in, in the size that we are and, and the partnerships that we have and the way that we've sort of had this criminal justice behavioral health partnership for so many years that I think we're in a little bit different position than most of the other counties that I talk to around this stuff. And I think the the, the like Clackamas and others that are sort of removed and in, in these um, kind of more unusual, more separated areas. Um, and then in the urban cities, it's interesting because they contract out so much of their um, behavioral health that the system can get pretty disjointed and difficult to navigate. So I think, I think because the way we do things in Deschutes County, we really have a pretty seamless system that works well. So I hope that that's what it ends up showing. We'll be collecting that data certainly. And if at the end of the two years, it doesn't show, that 24-7 is what is needed in this community, then that's not something we'll continue to pursue. Okay, thanks. So Holly, if the applications are due the 12th, are they gonna let you know on the 15th or? I uh, think they're gonna let us know by the, I think they're gonna let us know really soon because they are like chomping at the bit to get this money out the door. They, um, they, they are really, really eager to get this thing moving. So I think um, their schedule is to have a decision by kind of like, I think like the last week of June. So I think we'll hear quickly and then I think the money will flow. Okay, because so. then you'll have to hire all those people too. So that, that always yeah, takes our, time. Our plan, I mean, obviously would not be able to have everybody hired by July. Th these are difficult positions to hire for, particularly night shift, weekend, all that stuff. We're already seeing that with even our swing shift positions. So I, I, my hope would be that we would actually be able to operationalize if, we're, if awarded the funds by the fall. Um, I think that's a reasonable um, time frame to have gotten everyone hired and up and running. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Gabon? Well, with that discussion, I'll move uh, approval of application for the impacts grant to the Criminal Justice Commission. And I'll second it. Any further discussion? Mr. Devon? Yes. Mr. Henderson? I vote yes. And the chair votes yes. Thank you all very much. No, thank you yeah, for all the you work. Thank you very much. For all the work, Brandy and yep. Holly. You guys have worked a long time on this, so let's hope we're really successful. I hope so. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Um, we're now to the Board signature on Best Care Treatment Services contract. Janice Garceau. Good afternoon, commissioners. Um, it's been a long day for you. Uh, this is Janice Garceau, Deputy Director of Deschutes County Bureau of Health. 
Uh, I'm here to ask board consideration, approval, and signature on the Best Care Treatment Services contract number 2020-289. The contract covers the provision of um, I think your services. Piece of paper's going right on top of your microphone. microphone. So sorry. Um, I'll have to look down then to read. Uh, so Best Care Treatment Services will be providing under this contract in accordance with the OHA Prime Plus Peers Project services that include the use of peer recovery support mentors and a case manager to facilitate linkage between uh, the BEND ED and appropriate treatment resources. Um, this, these are grant funds that we came to the board about some time ago uh, that uh, OHA actually reached out to us and asked if we were interested in receiving these funds. Um, this particular program is a pilot program. It is established for the purpose of determining the effectiveness of establishing immediate access to appropriate evidence-based treatment for people who suffer from opioid addiction or are experiencing opioid overdoses or other substances, substance-related overdoses um, that present to the ED. The project will embed uh, one case manager uh, who is a CADC, a certified alcohol and drug counselor, and two peers in the BEND ED um, in order to quickly connect with these individuals and link them to treatment uh, services, whether that be mental health services or uh, substance use services. Um, the total amount uh, of the contract with Best Care is $477,600. That covers a period through June 30th of, um, sorry, let me get the exact dates. 2022. 2022, but it's not June 30th. It's actually May because of some Oh, right. It was syncrasies in the timing, May 31st, 2022. And that's it. Um, Janice, I didn't see the insurance binders attached. It says we were supposed to, um, on page, well, page 76 of our packet, page 18 of your document, it's, um, they say we must have a couple binders. So I just thought I'd bring that up. And then I did have a question for you. Um, do you have like a a 30 second definition? I noticed that we had serious and persistent mental illness uh, criteria, and one of them I didn't understand. I've I've never heard of it regarding um, personality disorder. I've heard of borderline, but I had not heard of is it schizo typal or something? What, it's what, a typo. Yes. What what is that? It's, um, it is a one of a classification of personality disorders in which there are some psychotic features. So people with schizotypal personality disorder may have some of the other kinds of behaviors and presentations that go with these personality disorders, but they also have uh, some psychotic features. Okay, thank you. I know you, yeah. you could tell me. So Dave, do you know where the binders are then? No, I know those get matched up before risk signs off and I see risk hasn't signed off on the on the uh, the risk language there, the, the provision there. So that'll Okay. That's how that works. It used to be uh, Lori, I, I'm not sure if that's something Sarah does, but one of them will make sure those connect before they sign off. Okay. Janice, this is Phil. Um, yes. so is this uh, you said it's embedded at the ED. Is it also connected somehow to the stabilization center? Wouldn't we have people that would be showing up there that might also want to go through the, this program? Yes, absolutely. Um, the reason that we selected Best Care to provide these services is because they're already using a model like this in the Redmond ED and in Madras. <clears throat> and in both of those situations, they're working in close collaboration with our MCAT team, which now is part of what is offered through the stabilization center. So all of these things are connected. These services are, uh, these folks are talking with each other regularly. Well, when you say embedded, I think that somebody is physically at the ED, is that? They are, they are physically at the ED to the extent allowed by the current um, 
paradigm, but they are physically in the ED. They are literally meeting with clients um, in the ED when they have recovered from overdose and working to engage with those individuals and connect them immediately to treatment resources. So uh, an example of where where this fills a gap that the stabilization center can't fill are people that cannot be immediately released from the ED because of the physical manifestations of the um, overdose experience that they've had. So this really allows for a layer of engagement um, immediately when people have experienced one of these events. So it might end up with some people coming to the stabilization center, but it might also end up with people that are at the stabilization center going to further treatment or whatever is what you're absolutely and this was something we we were planning for this weren't we as budgeted we were planning for this um it is budgeted and we had originally planned to have one of these positions in-house uh, as one of ours we ultimately made a decision that because best care has really um, offered this service very well in two other settings and because we uh, have enough limited duration positions. Um, currently, we let this one go completely via a contract um, and are really aligning the contract around our collaboration with each other on these clients. Okay. Uh, I think that's all I had. Thank you. Welcome, Commissioner. Commissioner Devon, did you have any? Ready for a motion, maybe. Okie doke. So I have a move board approval of signature uh, and signature of best care treatment services contract. Uh, document number 2020-289. Well, um, second that. Any further discussion? Mr. DeBone? Yes. Mr. Henderson? Yes. And the chair votes yes. Thank you so much, Janice. Thanks for all Thank you, you do and your leadership. Yes. Thank you, commissioners. Have a good day. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, I believe we're to Peter Russell. Correct. Good afternoon, commissioners. Can you hear me? Yes, we yes. can. Thank you, Peter. Um, where we're at now are the deliberations on the ODOT proposal to amend the transportation system plan to add roundabouts at US 20 and OB Riley and Cook in Tolo and US 20 in the old Ben Redmond Highway just to the edge of Ben and also modify a couple of tables in the TSP to change uh, interchange references to roundabout references and some text as well. Uh, so with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. You received all the public record and all the comments after your May 20th hearing. So you have the complete record before you. We've updated the binder. Um, and I, I now turn it over to you unless you have further questions. Um, Peter, would I be allowed to ask a question about the access for the Lodgepole Pine business that's there, that fencing company? They seemed very concerned about getting their vehicles in from the roundabout proposal. And I was wondering, Correct. have you looked? So that was in the record. Um, and yes. so what I responded as well is that during the actual construction, that's when ODOT would work with them to determine the access um, to the site using both ODOT standards for access as well as the county standards for access and distances. I know that Bob Townsend, the project manager, has been in um, several contacts with uh, the lawyer representing that particular property. So that is aware of that property owner's concerns about his business and how to get trucks in and out of there. Okay. So yeah, I, I see what the, the request, it's, it's an unknown future, but they're gonna build it as uh, appropriate as possible after this commitment is made. Cause I mean, I kind of went back and forth on that also. Well, they've been in business there since 1993. And I do drive by and I see their location every day. So it, you know, it definitely reminds me that getting trucks in and out is never easy. And um, so I just. Well, and the, you know, all four corners are gonna be like that. There's just gonna be impacts, but it is, it is a big commitment and the, the flow of the area. So just on that um, kind of general issue, Peter, right? Um, I've gone through this, some of this, we've already, we made a decision in Terrebonne and then we asked for some things there. I know there's some difficulties there that we're going to hear about. 
with regard to the off ramp and things we're gonna hear about that uh, fairly soon as commissioners I don't know if the other commissioners heard about that yet but one of the things I've always thought is yeah the refinement plan gets over our TSP changes or whatever get changes get made and but still you know how do we ensure that uh, the local citizens there have input and um, like somebody like this that has a real financial connection how do they get heard with ODOT after the after the cheering is over so some transportation projects do require further land use approval um, through site plan review some some do not depends if they need new right-of-way or not but you know ODOT has its own specifications and procedures of how they deal with property owners and there are appeal rights under those um, ODOT procedures if they're unhappy with uh, what the state agency is doing um, it's always that balancing act between looking at a system where you've got 20,000 cars going through an intersection versus a single property owner who has um, you know far 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 less traffic going on and off their property I get the to that particular property owner, that property is the most important thing to them for understandable reasons. We also have to look at what's the best for the system overall and the community overall. Well, yeah, I get that. I mean, I get that, but a win-win would be everybody's taken care of, and so it's diminishing issues. And I've just did the roundabout at 15th and Reed, I know that how driveways got changed and it works. And But there are, so how do you, but my question is really how do they involve or how do we guarantee that all those people are stay involved or get hurt? Because I know besides the the pole um, business, there was also another landowner that's right near there that sent a, a email after this time, or maybe it's a letter after the written record time, but it's still a true problem that they were concerned about access to one of the streets. I think it was Eighth Street. Mm -hmm. So how do all That'd those people Giesler's stay involved? Yes. What's that? That would be the Geeslers. So yeah, they'll still have access to 8th. It's just 8th becomes a, a right in, right out instead of all moves as it is right now. But they're not disconnected from 8th. And also their property has accesses to 8th, I believe, on both the east and the west side of that. Um, but I'm just really asking you, you're not ODOT. You're Deschutes County's person. And how, how do those people stay involved with this process? And how is, it, is there some way we guarantee that they at least get heard or something. Well, one way they'd stay involved with the process is if ODOT needs to purchase property from them, um, which is um, often the case. ODOT doesn't need like a lot of property, but sometimes you've got a turn lane, you need a little bit, or you might need an easement to put utilities in. So ODOT has to work with them from a standpoint if they actually need to physically access that property for various purposes of construction or easements or staging equipment. So they're involved that way. Commissioners, I can I can jump in here and maybe maybe help out. Uh, Chris Doty, Road Department. Um, in the case of this project, you know we uh, we'll be the primary funders based on you know some of the preliminary agreements that we have uh, already have in place with ODOT and our intent to to help fund this project. Uh, we will, as Deschutes County, um, enter uh, one or at least two more agreements with ODOT, uh, such that you know if we're not satisfied with you know how how things have progressed the design of the project you know we we ultimately have approval authority um given our, our financial stake in this project well that's good to know so you so one um i guess not remedy but way that that people can stay involved county residents is through county uh road department you're in and staying connected with what you're they can pass on their concerns to you, I guess, essentially. And you, Absolutely. And, and because we represent them, that would be, okay, that's good. I, I think that's important, and I, did, I do it Terrebonne also, and, and we've voiced that. Um, what's the discussion here? Uh, it was raised by uh, Lindsey Gould, but another letter, too, about this issue of funding from Eagle Crest and losing that funding source. And I, I didn't know about that until this. Um, I get the idea and then, so um, is that important? So, I mean, how's that fit in? Well, it's not an approval criteria for, for this text amendment, but the way it fits in is ODOT back 
circa 1998 when Eagle Crest was first developing, they put, you know, they built the 126 interchange. Eagle Crest put in, I think, 40% of the cost, ODOT 60%. And they also put money towards improvements to US 20 and Cook Avenue. Um, and that was, uh, they had an agreement with Eagle Crest. That agreement has since lapsed. I know that ODOT, because, uh, you know, the Thornburg one lapsed, um, the Eagle Crest one was there. I don't know. We asked, we've asked ODOT repeatedly if they could give us the update on that um, because it's, the Schutz County wasn't involved with that as all. Um, to date, we haven't heard anything from ODOT about, you know, where we are and that if they have the money, don't have the money, what, what's doing with it. As, as I read the, the agreement, however, that uh, it's for improvements at the intersection. So if we go from an interchange to a roundabout, if ODOT has the money, they can still spend it at that intersection. Um, if they don't have the money, um, that'll be between ODOT and the lawyers of Eagle Crest with what they'll do with that. Um, probably that was, so who's the beneficiary of that contract? Uh, in terms of financially, it's to ODOT's benefit to get this money so they could have used it to improve the intersection. And Correct. Eagle Crest was to pay ODOT money. Now in terms of county financial participation, we weren't a signatory to the agreement, but we do have countywide system development charges that we charge on either vacant land or land that's developed in more intense uses. And so we can take money and put it towards modernization projects such as this. So from, as Chris has relayed, the county is going to be a, a primary uh, financial partner in this. So there'll be money adequate to build the, uh, the improvement. Peter, I did have a question about the underpass. You know, I know there were originally planning it to be up the hill because it was going to be cheaper because of the slope. Um, and then somebody mentioned, I believe it was Nancy's letter, mentioned lowering it a bit because it would be more accessible to go over to the shopping area across on the other side of 20. Is that something that really hasn't been determined yet, correct? For the underpass, are you talking about the concept I-3 that we're not doing, or are you talking right. about the bike ped? Well, not going across the highway, but the underpass itself. Bike, for bikes to go some pedestrians. By, yes, the bike pad. Yeah. Pedestrian, so, safer under the, under the highway instead of, like, walking across it. Okay, yeah. So ODOT is committed to looking that again, um, at it, and where's the best place for grade for, for getting it to it. Uh, the other thing is you get closer and closer to the river, you start running into water table issues, which is one of the challenges when they got deeper into the uh, – design work on the I-3 concept because uh, yeah, the river's right there. So um, you can start running into issues there. So I know that ODOT has looked at fourth. They've looked at fifth for uh, getting back and forth. The advantage is, you know, you're closer to the school that way. Right. Thank you. So we are deliberating. Do you want to continue? Um, yeah, I mean, I've kind of made up my mind. I want to say a few things about it my mind made up. Okay. Any questions? Yeah, no other questions. No other questions. I'm ready for... So, um, I'm going to just voice my, you know, my concern, which I've voiced numerous times before, that um, that a roundabout is a thing that really does slow down traffic. And I guess what bothers me about putting it there as compared to, the, like, the one in Sisters, which I really like, is the fact that I think most people going through that intersection are going from point A to point B, and point B is somewhere past that intersection. And um, it's going to end up, I, I'm a fan of uh, roundabouts for light traffic and moderate traffic, but in heavy traffic, I find them just backing up and they slow things down, and I, I'm not, I don't like them for that. Um, for me, I guess I've come to the conclusion that I'm, I'm going to support this, but I don't really, I, I wish we had the money to do an overpass. And I guess I'll say it, uh, you know, I'm used to the way they do things in Eugene or in Salem where you're, you know, in Eugene they have the beltways, they all go on overpasses over the main roads. And so people can go under, you know, they can walk through there, or ride bikes through there. But I think about the Pape, you know, belt line. And in Salem, it's I-5. You know, there's the places to get to e the west, you know, between s the different parts of Salem. Real easy, real comfortable driving through those, whereas when I'm on I-5, I can just stay driving at the same speed. And I, 
I guess what I see happening is that there's a lot of emphasis on safety here, but uh, it's the really is, I don't know how on particularly this intersection, I don't know how um, dangerous it is. I've been, my last big construction project, I was, used that, that intersection every day to get to the job and get home from the job. So for about six months I drove through it and I see how difficult it is to get out of, from Cook, especially coming into Bend. And uh, just, it's a lot of traffic, but I just wish, I, I don't quite get to how the state system doesn't have money to build overpasses and, and things like they've done for 50 or 75 years when we're in the best economy, we, or we were until three months ago, the best economy we've been in in years. Um, the other part is that I guess where there's a changing of goals that are different than mine. I figured out I've, I've been driving for 49 years now and my main thing is from getting point A to point B, it's not about the journey and not about that. It's just getting to where I'm trying to go. And I think this is going to be, I think people are not going to like this over, as it goes on. And, but that isn't what the testimony was from everybody during the refinement process, apparently. And this is, we, didn't, we did hear some people that don't li didn't like it. They would rather go with the overpass as well. But I guess what all I've heard is we don't have the money to do it. But I... I'm frustrated with that. So, given that, I'm going to support it. But it's, I don't think, I don't know. It's, I wish we had options because we do need to improve that Cook, Cook intersection. But I, I just think this is a, I don't know. It's it's not a, the place I'd put one of these. So. So this is going to be a quite a corridor from the outside of Sisters into Bend with all these roundabouts. I mean, that's the vision. That's the long-term plan here. Uh, when I get to the uh, west side of Sisters, I, I, I haven't seen it backed up. Uh, I haven't been there in a, a holiday weekend in the prime, but I haven't really seen it backed up either. I'm just referring to the far side of Sisters at this point in time. Um, long-term safety and support of a flow It'll be nice to be able to go, uh, you know, towards Bend from that Cook intersection, uh, taking a left cross. Uh, people do get pretty frustrated there sometimes. Um, it was interesting. I mean, Peter just mentioned uh, water table issues with trying to go over and under. We didn't even get to that. I mean, I'd never even heard about that, but that makes a lot of sense that there would be other water table issues even if you wanted to do that. I guess the underpass, you know, maybe not an overpass, but. So, I mean, I'm supportive, and, and it, it'll be quite, the whole thing is going to be a, a very much a, a unique feature in the state of Oregon, because think about a log truck or a delivery truck starting at the far side of Sisters, and, you know, 10, 15 years from now, there's going to be, what, five or six of them before you can get to Bend. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, I like the one in Sisters, I, and I like it. I would like it at the other end. I wish, I actually would rather put that in right away than waiting on that, the one at the east side of it but it, I guess partly it's because I've been dri driving for 20 minutes or whatever so you get there and I like driving through sisters and looking at everything so it doesn't bother me the same way I'm, and then and, and when we're coming into sisters you're slowing down anyway to get through so you should be so yeah. I, yeah well you have to yeah. Yeah. Yep. You have to so I, I just I feel differently about those than I it's just these particular locations I'm not really an advocate for uh, and I wish we had the money to just do an underpass for Cook and really just build over, not go down, but build over. Like, like I said, for 50 years, that's what our highway system, or maybe more, has done. And it really works w well in Salem and Eugene to get people around the city, those cities, when they need to get through things and around things. And uh, we'll we'll see. But so I, I believe you must be talking about the overpasses up. Um, off of 97, when you almost get to Biggs up there, there's some of them in the middle of um, not too much of a population, and yet there's some beautiful um, ways to get on and off 97. Yeah, well, through, and throughout Oregon there are. If you go to the coast, you'll go across things like that, and you'll say, well, how did they afford this here? But all of a sudden now we don't have the money to do it, and we had the biggest transportation bill in history. Yeah, I think past, there's... And we don't have the money to do this in Deschutes County, so I don't know, well, it's surprising to me that that's... Oh, the one I'm right. thinking of is the one that goes to Wasco off of 97, so it's... Oh, uh, I know what you mean, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's up there and it's beautiful and there's room and everything. Um, yes, I was actually on the advisory board and, it, you know, it was fairly 
you know, positive for um, what we're what they're planning to do, the roundabouts. I mean, it was the um, large majority was supportive, and then I went to the public hearing, and that um, testimony that evening um, repeated that even to a greater extent. Um, and I, I know I've tried to calculate how many extra minutes this is going to take into my drive, but the, I look at it as the good news is it will slow people down. Um, you can be going 64 miles an hour from sisters to here, and you can be passed like you are going backwards. So the roundabouts, I don't know if the people will go even faster when there's not a roundabout, you know, and then they're going to get to the roundabout and slow down. But yes, no, people, um, you know, Oregonians love to drive fast. So it will definitely um, slow the traffic down in those um, locations. And I think, you know, the Tumbla one is one matter, and then the other uh, roundabout is really critical because of the school that they added on the other side of the highway. And definitely that one, I'm really glad that um, ODOT has the funding for that, Peter, that second roundabout. So that that can actually be done um, together, and we can clean up our um, highway system a bit. And I think it'll make it a lot safer for the neighbors that live out there because they were they were almost 99 percent unanimously supporting putting that second roundabout in. I mean, they have terrible backups there. I see it all the time. Yeah. So, do we um, would we like to approve the plan amendment as proposed? Approve it with modifications, deny the plan amendment. Do we have a motion? So I'll uh, move to approve amending Deschutes County Transportation System Plan and add roundabouts to US 20 and Cook OB Riley and US 20 Old Ben Redmond Highway intersections and amend tables 5.3.T1 and 5.3.T2. And I'll second that. Any further discussion? Commissioner Devon? Yes. Commissioner Henderson? Yes. And the chair votes yes. So uh, just for clarification, can you, uh, Peter, can you explain the amend tables? Because I followed the agenda, but now I don't know exactly what that means. <laughs> sure. Um, and, and I'll be back with, with the ordinance that will, you know. Okay. So that's, this. yeah. But the, more the quick and dirty um, explanation is where on those tables it said interchange, that word will be replaced with roundabout. And then there was another, the latter table, 10.2, um, was a illustrative unfunded projects. We'll pull that out because ODOT. I was confident they have money for the U.S. 20 Old Ben yeah, Redmond. Okay. okay. So this will be done more officially in an ordinance coming up. Though. Yes, yes. You'll get an ordinance with, with the usual exhibits of so the TSP map, the amended tables, the text, uh, all that. I didn't want to presume what decision you're going to make, so that's why you don't have the ordinance with the exhibit packets yeah. today. But I'll work with Sharon to come back and see you all again. Like next Wednesday? Is that what you're thinking? That, that's what I'm thinking. What else? I'll check with Sharon and Tom okay. and see what they say. Great. We like to work long days so I'll be sure and add it next Wednesday because I know ODOT uh, wants to get this plan going. We do, we do. No, I mean we do. We want to, this is important, this is important for our county and I know that ODOT is counting on us. We take a four hour meeting and make it six hours. We like these long days. No, no, I didn't mean that. Just oh, meant. It's, it sounded this is like a, that's what you meant. <laughs> well, it's these, exactly what it sounded like. Well, okay, I made a mistake again. Gosh. Oh, Thank my you gosh. very much and I appreciate all the questions. Thank you, Peter. Okay, we're now waiting for Tanya. There she is. Thank you, Here. Chris. Uh, speaking of long days, Tanya Saltzman, Associate Planner. Um, thank you, huh. board. Uh, this is a public hearing, and I will start by reading the opening process uh, script with assistance from Chair Adair. Um, and then I have a presentation, and um, we'll go from there. So this is the time and place set for hearing on file number 247 ta concerning amending the Deschutes County Code to allow child care as a permitted use with site plan review in zones where it previously required a conditional use permit. The Board of County Commissioners will hear oral testimony, receive written testimony, and consider the testimony submitted at this hearing. Due to COVID-19, the hearing will be conducted remotely via Zoom in addition to limited in-person attendance. The board and staff will be panelists, the applicant and the public will be attendees and will have the microphones muted until raised to panelist status by the chair. The process will be as follows. Staff, which in this case is the applicant, will give its report. For public participating by video, the chair will announce the name of the person to be elevated to panelist and unmuted to provide his or her testimony. 
then be returned to attendee status with microphone muted. For the public members participating by telephone, the chair will announce the last four numbers of the phone number and ask if the person wishes to provide testimony. The person will be elevated to panelist and unmuted and respond yes or no if they wish to provide testimony. If no, they're returned to attendee status and muted. If yes, the person provides testimony, then is returned to attendee status and muted. The hearing is also being recorded. The board may make a decision on this matter today, continue the public hearing to a date certain, or leave the written record open for a specified period of time. The hearing will be conducted in the following order. Staff will give a report on the issue. We will then open the hearing to all present remotely as described above, followed by anybody in person. You can also provide the, the board with a copy of written testimony. Questions to and from the chair may be entertain, entertained at any time at the chair's discretion by using the raise your hand feature in Zoom. Cross-examination of people testifying will not be allowed. However, if any person wishes to ask a question of, an, of another person during that person's testimony, please use the raise your hand feature in Zoom. The chair is free to decide whether or not to ask such questions of the person testifying. Prior to the commencement of the hearing, any party may challenge the qualifications of any commissioner for conflict of interest by using the raise your hand feature in Zoom. This challenge must be documented with specific reasons supported by facts. Should any commissioner be challenged, the member may disqualify himself or herself, withdraw from the hearing, or make a statement on the record of their capacity to hear and decide this issue. At this time, do any members of the board need to set forth any information that may be perceived as a conflict of interest? Uh, I, have, I have none. I don't think I have any, had any conversation with anyone about specific properties or an interest in this matter. Um, I don't have any personal property myself in these areas. Thank you. I was supposed to say, does any commissioner have oh. anything to disclose? And if so, please state the nature of same and whether you can proceed. It was on the back side. Oh, so that's okay. Um, I have none. And I want to thank Tanya for your work. I have none. Uh, just one point, though. I think uh, we've got this letter from Megan Norris, Central Oregon Child Care Accelerator. I'm just acknowledging I think we might have donated funds to the effort going on through Central Oregon, Ben Chamber of Commerce, Governor's Solution Committee to advocate for child care. So, I mean, it's not a land use conflict in any sense, but it's just it's kind of a small world that we've, we've generally supported already, you know, the concept of child care. Yes. Do I need to restate okay. my... No. I think it's okay. I think that was clear. And this is a legislative matter, so, um, oh, yeah, so unless you have some personal gain by way of owning a child care business or yep. expecting to own one, you can. Yeah, no conflict. Yeah, no, you're allowed no, to be biased. You're, you're, oh, there you go. You're we'll wearing your legislative hat here, biased. so you're Good. allowed to have an opinion already. Okay. Okay. Does any party wish to challenge any commissioner based on conflicts of interest? As no challenges are presented prior to opening the hearing, does anyone have any procedural objections to the public hearing? Seeing none, the hearing is now open. Staff will proceed with a brief staff report. Thank you, Chair Adair. I'm just going to share my screen now. If you give me one moment, please. Okay, hopefully you should be able to see that. Yes. Yes. Uh, okay, wonderful. Um, this is the public hearing as noted for file number 247 ta ordinance number 2020-010. Um, and this is just an overview of the Zoom hearing, um, how this will work. Um, if there is public testimony, there's another statement to read uh, prior to that to explain how that works. Again, this is further, uh, further discussion of that as well as the written version of the opening statement that we just reviewed. Okay, so would you like me to um, record only if there's public testimony? Is there any? Yeah, it, can be, it can wait until if there is public testimony because if, if there okay. isn't, uh, you don't need to bother, All right. I think. So, okay. Yeah, so I'll just go on with the proposal. Uh, the proposal is to allow daycare, preschool, day nurseries, and childcare facilities as a use permitted outright subject to site plan review in zoning districts where such uses are currently a conditional use. As well, uh, the amendments clarify and consolidate definitions of childcare uses to correspond to Oregon revised statutes. 
Um, and just to uh, give a quick background, we had a work session with the a staff had a work session with the board uh, two days ago on June 1st, at which time the entire record was uh, provided. A little bit of background, um, according to an OSU and Oregon Early Learning Division paper, Deschutes County is considered a childcare desert. And in this sense, that means there's three children for every one available childcare slot. Um, and just a note that this was before COVID. So, you know, things might have changed since then. I don't have data on that, but this is um, just in normal times. Currently in the Deschutes County Code, child care related uses require a conditional use permit in the districts where it's allowed. As a result of this, plus the, um, the child care desert status of the Deschutes County, the Board of County Commissioners directed staff to create amendments that would reduce the barriers to establishing child care in the county while still maintaining the protections of zoning. And as I acknowledged in the work session, this is obviously a a multifaceted issue that you know transcends land use, but we're doing what we can here because what we address here is land use. This is a brief summary of all of the chapters where uh, child care related uses are currently a conditional use and the amendments will change it to permitted subject to site plan review. And these are outlined further in the packet as well as the, um, the original text in the exhibits. To be clear, the amendments don't add child care related uses to zones in which they don't already exist. So it's just changing that status within those existing zones. Secondly, um, staff was tasked with addressing residential child care. And um, it's actually the answer is already in our code and we're already proceeding um, with as few barriers as possible. Um, for per both state statute as well as our code, family child care providers is considered a residential use of the property. So it's subject to the same level of restrictions as any other dwelling. Um, you cannot regulate it to be more restrictive than anything else. So residential child care is already um, pretty much covered in the existing code. Uh, the definition, the one thing, the one change that the amendments do do is they uh, amend the definition of family child care provider to correspond with the ORS definitions. And this is a limit of 16 children rather than 13 children. And then the amendments also clarify the definitions. Uh, as I noted in the work session, our current code titles 18 and 19 use uh, a myriad of terms describing childcare. There's a bunch of them. Some of them have definitions provided, some of them don't at all. So for clarity, uh, staff consolidated those definitions into one umbrella term child care facility, which was previously not in the code, and that refers that definition to the Oregon revised, sta revised statute. So that covers kind of everything and makes it exactly in parallel with the state. And similar to that, we added a definition of preschool, which previously didn't exist in code, although there were references to it. And that also refers the definition to ORS, just so everything's uh, in, the same, in the same purview. In terms of transportation, uh, transportation planner, senior transportation planner, excuse me, Peter Russell uh, reviewed the amendments and found that there's no significant impact to the existing facilities. This is largely because daycare uses have what's um, called a high pass by rate. In other words, you're not making a separate trip to drop off your children. You're on your way to work. So you drop off your kids, you're on your way back from work or to the supermarket or what have you. So it's already built in. So it's not creating this additional strain on the system. As such, uh, he found it to be compliant with Goal 12 and the transportation planning rule. A uh, planning commission hearing was held on May 14th, 2020. Um, there was a great discussion and there, they led us to kind of uh, delve into some details that we hadn't initially uh, delved into. So we're thankful for that. And the planning commission voted unanimously to recommend approval to the board um, with a few clerical corrections. Um, and then some con uh, a request to consider revising the definitions, which we have for this version presented before the board. To date, we've received two written public comments. Um, one from, was from the Central Oregon Associati Association of Realtors. Uh, that was for the Planning Commission hearing. And then last night, we received one from the Central Oregon Child Care Steering Committee. Um, I provided hard copies of those on um, the podium. And those are both in support. And that's a summary of all the um, of the potential amendments. So then right now there are three options to move forward. The hearing can be continued to a date certain. We can close the hearing and leave the written record open to a date certain or close the hearing and commence deliberations. 
And with that, I'm open to any questions. Thank you. I think we're at the public hearing now, and then that's the next step. Correct. So do we, but we can do questions of her now, right, yeah. of the application. So, um, Tanya, I had a question um, back on the page where you list the text amendments. It's all based on different communities, um, Alfalfa, Terrebonne, Tumalo, and then uh, Rural Commercial, Ben UA. Um, I thought we also were changing it just generally throughout the county for rural residential and, and um, multiple use agriculture, et cetera, that those zones also, do they, is that not true? Um, no, actually, because those, um, it was not already a use permitted by, it was not in those chapters as a, as a use that was subject to conditional use okay. permit. You could always do it residentially, though. That's the key. So you can, um, as long as it's 16 kids or children or less in a residential facility, then that's already good. But there wasn't already a provision in the code allowing kind of the more commercial types um, okay. In those zones. So this is the list of the areas. So these are all kind of communities, basically. So we're saying in real in the communities that are unincorporated, we're able to, to we'd be now able to do it without the conditional use. Exactly. Exactly. So those, yeah, those are much more kind of. They already allow some degree of kind of yeah. commercial oriented. So that's why those are just. So uh, we didn't I don't think we had a map, but uh, the Ben U A. Suburban, low density, urban, standard residential, and light industrial. To me, those would be the ones where it'd be most likely to happen because that's where so many of the people live and bend. They aren't necessarily going to want to run their kids to Tumalo for a daycare, preschool, or whatever. They're, but they might do it. They might go to an industrial area. Or, so, do we have a map in the that kind of shows where we're talking about for those areas? We're kind of opening up some areas, basically, in the urban area. Is that right? Well, we're not particular. I mean, I will say the the zones that we're addressing, they already you can already have childcare. It's just a little bit harder to do it presently because it requires a conditional use permit. So there's no zones that it was not allowed in already. Um, we're just changing it from a conditional use to a site plan review. So we're not adding. Just meant, oh, yeah, that's what I meant. Opening up, mean, yeah. ease, making it easier. Oh, opening up, okay. not not changing the rules, but or, well, we're changing the rules, but making the process easier. Understood. And it, and it um, I don't have a map of that, but I could certainly provide that. Um, we could show a zoning map and where kind of where all those zones exist. Um, is that what you would be looking for? I would just, and not necessarily with regard to making the decision, but uh, just so I know what good we did, so to speak. Because I, <laughs> I think the point was to try to be responsive to the need for more child care. And so what, what, where did we accomplish what? I was just kind of curious of that. So Sure. Yeah, I could um, definitely create a map and maybe highlight the zones where, there, yeah. where that change is happening, for sure. Okay. That's all I had. Thank you. Thanks. And it will actually reduce the cost then for those that are um, getting the child care application in. Is, and not only will That's it be correct. easier, but it will reduce their costs, which in this um, environment is really very important. So to um, lessen the impact of the desert of child care. Hello, Peter. Did you want to add? Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the commission. Peter Gutowski, Deschutes County Planning Manager. I just wanted to respond to Commissioner Henderson's questions regarding the Title 19 zone. Um, and we can certainly provide a map, but just for clarity, the, um, the light industrial zone in Title 19 just pertains to the Deschutes County uh, Jail. Um, and so that that is, uh, you know, again, kind of a, a isolated zoning uh, in that zone just because of statutory requirements that uh, ensure that uh, the jail is separated from from municipal city limits. Um, and then, is believe it not, or not uh, so is it not the whole public safety campus? It's just it is, it, yeah, good question. I believe it, it, it represents the public safety campus exclusively. Well, but that's a bigger, that's a bigger area than just the jail, so that would yeah, and we can we can provide a map. I just w wanted to make clear that it wasn't uh, a larger area than the public safety campus. And then um, 
the suburban low density residential zone just just conceptually that's the area that's east of 18th street near the pilot butte canal um uh in kind of the greater bend area and then believe it or not when bend um uh established its uh urban growth boundary uh, uh amendments uh to bring to identify land that uh, could come into to city limits there is there is land that's just outside the UGB that encompasses this very small portion of a uh, what we're calling an urban standard residential zone. It's it's uh, in generally speaking, it's kind of in the Aubrey Glen area um, of the city, but it's it's an it's so small it cover it encompasses I want to say less than ten lots, and it's. Ideally, something that the city should bring into its urban growth boundary and um, recognize through, through city zoning, but it's a legacy designation. So, uh, again, just just for context, the Title 19 is is a bit obscure, but has some of those spatial limitations that I've just described. But but say those 10 lots, wouldn't that be a if somebody wanted to start a facility like this? while they're not it's not in the urban growth boundary it sounds like they could now do it and it'd be on the west side or the one on uh, east of 18th would be on the north i think that mm -hmm. would be the northeast so that would be a there'd just be easier easy places to possibly do it and maybe less expensive land or i don't, I don't know right no you're exactly right the the, the provision that, that tanya underscored the family care provider uh, you know, likely would for, for existing residential homes, I, I would, you know, the family care provider definition in our that's prepared or refined in our code consistent with state laws, the way we collectively thought would be uh, more likely to help meet that need for, for child care as of as opposed to uh, a, more of a commercial facility where all of a sudden you're dealing with commercial building standards and and sprinklers and 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 whatnot. So um, that was our our way of uh, definitely trying to be a, uh, accountable to the board's direction, which was to really uh, limit the the regulatory burden on on those uh, in those zones where uh, childcare is a conditional use, and for those are predominantly residential zones, as Tanya's described, the family care provider definition with up to 16 children um, uh, seem to seem to meet that objective as well. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Thank you. Oh, and if I may add one quick thing, just a procedural thing. I have included in the packet both emergency and non-emergency versions of the ordinance, and that is um, if the board chooses to go ahead into deliberations, that is a decision that should be made as well. And if it is an emergency, it has to be unanimous, correct? Correct. Okay. All right. So. Do we have any testimony? Is there any testimony? We have no testimony. Okay, we do have two public support letters in our file, and we have heard um, repeatedly about our child care desert. So, all right. So I'm sure they probably are following their children around today, wouldn't you say? <laughs> and they don't have time for our public hear hearing. Um, okay. So, do we want to close the hearing to a date certain? Close the oral record and leave the written record open. Close the oral and written and set a date for deliberations or close the hearing and begin deliberations. I'm in favor of closing the hearing and the written record and beginning deliberations. Okay. I support that also. Okay, so it's um, been moved and seconded. And um, any other discussion? Mr. Henderson? Well, it's. Um, you know, a little unclear how much impact we'll have with this. I think it's what we can do within our scope. Uh, the fact that there's nobody, actually, you know, complaining about the policy helps it easier to be supported. So I'm gonna, I do support the idea. I would, I would like to a little more clarity about where it opens up and bend, but I, 
even in Tumlo or Terrebonne or Alfalfa, there, there's there's kids everywhere, so it might have some other possibilities that it helps. And uh, so I'm in support of that. So on some of the uh, choices made by the planning staff, and thanks to, to the planning commission for reviewing this and getting the word out, getting it through a process before it came to us. But it's getting a, getting back to the. Uh, um, you know, state law. Instead of being more limiting than state law, we're basically as as far as we can go with relative to land use in the state of Oregon. So uh, it's a good place to be. A little effort. Hopefully, some people will look at this uh, result when it comes out and see if there's some opportunities out there to add some of these daycare spots. Exactly, and possibly in spots where you couldn't have imagined it in the past so I think that's really wonderful and I do want to reiterate that if you have six children you can only take ten more and if you do have six children and they're going to school you still have to you are still limited to ten which according to the um, state guidelines in the last couple of months that seems to be more so it I'm glad Tanya you've done you know your research and we're matching the state um, what's in the state law. So, yes, um, I can't imagine being responsible for 16 children at the same time. So that would be a workout, wouldn't it? So um, we've had then the motion to close the hearing, begin deliberations. Any other comments? No, I would. So would this be the time we'd move to approve the ordinance? Certainly could at this point. Yeah. So okay. I guess I would move to approve ordinance number 2020-010 and uh, if it's if it's unanimous I'd move to do it by emergency order okay so if we do an emergency I'd, I'd suggest 30 days and uh, you know effective in 30 days uh, not not immediately just to give it that buffer and timing period I'm fine with that so that's fine I'll support a third or a, yeah 30 day for emergency purposes okay the motion has been made and seconded with a 30-day um, placement to put it effective. Um, Commissioner Henderson, all in favor? I vote yes. Commissioner Devon? Yes. And the chair votes yes. Okay, so that would require a first and second reading by the chair. Right. By title only and noting that it's a adopted emergency 30 days effective from today. And then after you read that twice, then there could be a motion to adopt. There we go. Okay. Now we're getting there. I read that we have an ordinance. And Do I have to move yeah, the, to make the motion by reading only? Yeah. Somebody has to move that. I think it was implied in there, okay. but you certainly could if you want to make it. Go ahead and clear. do you want to do that? Well, I move um, a <laughs> approval of ordinance number 2020-010 by title only, first and second readings. And that would be with the 30-day emergency? With the, th with the 30 day uh, emergency clause. And I'll second it, yeah. Okay. Further discussion, Commissioner Henderson? Yes. Commissioner DeBone? Yes. And the chair votes yes. So I'm going to read, we are, um, we've approved an ordinance amending Deschutes County Code Title 19, Deschutes County Zoning and Title 19 Bend Urban Area Zoning to permit child care uses as a use permitted outright subject to site plan review and declaring an emergency in 30 days. So I think just for clarity, I think it was Title 18 of Deschutes County Zoning and Title 19 of Bend Urban Area Zoning. I think you read it reverse. I just read it what it said here. Did I say it wrong? I, well, I maybe, well, this one. I read maybe maybe which one comes first in yours? Maybe it is. Right. I say mine says Title 18 here, and then I read Title 19. Did I? Think I you said the opposite, but I did. <laughs> okay. But did I tell you? Someone tell me. The tape. Somebody play back the tape. Hmm? Well, I, I was I was staring at 18 when you said 19. I thought, and then I you, don't know. But anyway, I'm just. You can clarify it by just saying. Okay, do I How about do the it? second reading and then we'll the see what it sounds like then. <laughs> okay. I, I think you're fine. You could do a, a second reading. I would like to now do a second reading correctly if I didn't do it the first time. Okay, an ordinance amending Deschutes County Code Title 18. Ooh. Oh, I almost did it wrong that time. Deschutes County Zoning and Title 19 
ban urban zo area zoning to permit child care uses as a use permitted outright subject to site plan review and declaring an emergency in 30 days. So at this time I'll move adoption of ordinance number 2020-010. I'll second that. Any further discussion? Commissioner DeBone? Yes. Commissioner Henderson? Yes. And the chair votes yes. Right. And well, wow. all right. Thank you, commissioners. I will have a revised version with the 30-day uh, part and the draft watermark removed to share. Okay. Thank, thank you, you so thanks, much, Tanya. Thank you very much. It's, yes. Just think, it was something we were talking about um, January 30th, and <laughs> we're no, we're doing it June 3rd. Yeah, we got it. So this yeah. is yeah, that's great. I, thank you so much. And I'm sure that there's going to be some people in our community that are going to go, oh my gosh, maybe this is something I could do, um, help my community, and actually help myself. So exactly, I appreciate it. Thank you. Oh boy. Okay, so. Okay. Other items? Yes. What are the other items? We got a couple. There's several, I guess. All right. Should we start. Sure. So. Um, it's been brought to my attention that the up in Lower Bridge area, North County, we've had a real um, kind of farm catastrophe up there with the storm last weekend. And we got a, I got an email from one of the farmers up there that wanted to have us declared a disaster area. I've got some pictures here that show kind of what it looks like now and what it looked like before. And I, I think if we look at the pictures, they show how these crops are growing and how they've been beat down and, and then the wheat fields you can see how what it looked like before and after so I'll pass those I don't know the steps I'm going to go up and look at it tomorrow uh -huh. so I just bring it to your attention and uh, I think it gives them the opportunity for some relief on things um, so and I just want to bring it I don't know if any of you talked to anybody about I, it I just talked to Cindy Grossman from Faith Hope and Charity and all the vines are were decimated. Yeah. She's not sure she'll have a crop even next year. It's so. You well, know, this it farmer horrific. said he'd lost 95 percent of his his crops, just d devastated by the hail. So I don't know what the next step is with a disaster. I know that um, the Jefferson County is all is also uh, looking at this, or, and um, so I we need to research it more. But I'm going to go up tomorrow and talk to this farmer and look around, but. But bring it up this week, and maybe next by next week we'll have something to propose. So someone who was just getting ready to cut their alfalfa field, the alfalfa field was decimated. Yeah. Maybe it, I don't know, but Cindy was. Yeah, I'm driving by. I'm going to be going by on Saturday. Well, I saw it on the news, but I didn't realize the extent of the damage. I guess in the, some of these areas, and so it was interesting because it happened here, and it also happened in Eastern Oregon. Almost. Yeah. 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 I mean, it was really. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, roofs were ripped off, trees were decimated, um, the power, yeah, Crooked River took a lot of damage. But yeah, definitely the farming community off of Lower Bridge, going down Holmes and then Lower Bridge, right down from me actually. Yeah. And we didn't have any, we didn't lose any trees, but driving home, there was hail, giant hail on both sides of Friar Road, so. So oh, I guess we've done this before, Dave, and know how to proceed. Okay, so yeah, you could do a uh, emergency declaration based on that uh, natural disaster and, and identify a specific area of the county if it's not countywide. Okay, we've done that in the case of drought and I believe fires before as well. So the that's the second thing is we've also been asked by Central Oregon or the um, what's it called CYD. Board of Control. Oh. It's Board of the. The Shoots Basin Board, Shoots Basin Board of Control to, to uh, declare the Shoots County a disaster area f for, with regard to water. Um, and apparently Jefferson County has already done it and Crook County is considering it today. We and, have prepared a draft. Uh, oh, you've. Tom's vetting it, I think, with the water master and also some of the other water purveyors. Oh, okay, good. Well, I didn't know you were already doing it. So, yeah, so that's what Craig Har Harrell told me to do is get the wording you're doing the whereas's and all that sort of thing and because they have a pretty good list of well that's what we were I think reaching back out to it was kind of general the information he provided yeah more of the particulars and I believe Tom's gonna check with the water 
uh, master to make sure. And I'd be happy to help with that too because I go to, was on that committee and um, and we're going to have a call in tomorrow to the irrigation. It's called this irrigation group and we do a Zoom meeting tomorrow and I guess it's on the agenda for tomorrow so we can help get all those whereases right and. Um, and I guess usually it's done later in the year, but they just already know they're going to need more water. They said Wikiup's the lowest it's ever been this year. They can't use Crane Prairie. Snowpack's down. Um, I can send the draft to all three of you right now, and it is just a rough draft. Okay. So is that something that we could actually not, we won't be able to vote on until next Wednesday? And Craig said that was okay. That, that That's they're okay. really not needing it, but they just know it's coming, so they're going to do it. So yeah, wait until July. Provided us was a little skinny on facts, and I, I don't know that we'd want to push that through to the state without a little more substance behind it. So you're talking to Kyle Gorman, probably. Yeah, I understand. Kyle and Jeremy Griffin is our local water master, but yeah, I think we're basically declaring a drought and, and asking for the state also to um, declare an emergency in our whichever counties. So sad because Umatilla and Morrow County are over 100 percent. And, you know, up there, the, you know, they had all that spring flooding and everything, and and yet ours are the worst ever. So. Well, that's, yeah, that's how it goes, though. That I think um, Malheur County's up. The Warm Springs Reservoir's full, too. Really? Okay. But this is, you know, we've only had a, we haven't even had half as much rain as we have normally this year. And last year, we had almost twice as much rain as we have normally. That's how different the two years are. Well, the sister's average is 33 inches of snow a year, and what have we had, like maybe 8 or 10? I mean, just it's been minuscule, so, and then we haven't really had that much rain. Do, do you have more on that, Tom? I'm, I'm happy to work in concert with you. I don't want to get in front of you. I thought I haven't sent the note yet because I haven't had a chance, but I'll copy you. Yeah, I know Jeremy pretty well, too, yeah. so, but I just, I'm interested because it's, um, interested in how it goes together and stuff, but yeah, you can get the first. That's good. We're drafting it. Um, well, the other another thing I want to just uh, mention. Uh, I got a call today about um, the homeless camp over by Revere and and uh, Division. From somebody said he's almost hit people twice in the last couple of days on the road there. I don't know if you guys know where that is, but. It's brought to my attention, and I don't know if there's anything we oh, there's can do or a little patch of county-owned land over there. If that's the one you're referring to, it might, yeah, I don't know where the county land is, but it might be. There's a homeless camp there. Well, there was one camper. If it's the same one, I mean, they're they're everywhere. But um, on the county-owned piece over there, Christie is already working with uh, both Ben PD and the sheriff's office to clear that one off, and she had. Oh, okay. He had some assistance. Uh, if if it's a different one, you know, obviously the um, it's within the city's jurisdiction, Ben PD. But um, certainly we can help. If I drive that way all the time, and I I have seen someone right up there next to like, um, you know, the road. Uh, Train road. tracks. Right yeah, right up in there. Yes. So, but I've no, haven't had the experience of them running across. But you know, I'm sure it's will be coming. So, is where's the county's property then? Actually, with Rivera and um, Division. I, I think it. I don't think it's the same one. I believe ours is just on the other side of the Parkway, um, on south of where only and there, there's a linen place over there on. I guess that'd be uh, Second Street. So, if you mentioned Revere, which is further north, then that's that's probably not ours. Oh yeah, I, yeah. I don't. Even, I don't know. I didn't talk to the person. I know the. I know the person. He's a friend, but I don't. He he left a message for beer and division. So, yeah. I guess we can follow up maybe further. Well, yeah, and I'm not sure if he's made contact with. Um, certainly, they can call the non-emergency number, and then PD will be um, assigned to it. I think he. Yeah, he mentioned that he talked to the somebody in law enforcement. Okay, I'll follow up. Do you have anything else, Commissioner Henderson? Uh, do I have one other thing? Go ahead. And no, go ahead. I, want to you want you. I got a couple things. Yeah. That's fine. Um, 
So we we're going to maybe talk about uh, facility project review committee. I just had this paperwork. This oh, yeah. is from the other day. Are you ready for that? Yeah. Oh, there you go. There, that was quick. Okay. I didn't so then bring my paperwork, but I, I thought we might. But yeah, I bring it down here. But oh. I don't think I need it necessarily. I looked at it the other day when I was at home, waiting for the septic clean out. Good. Well, I, he was ready. Yeah, well, it backs up your field, and then it, it was partially from the storm. Yeah, that backs into your tank. You get so much water in your system. Would you like a copy? I have one. Oh, oh yeah, if you got one. You have X two or one? No, one. <laughs> well, I'll take one page. Yeah. You can have the other. Oh, you can share. Take a look at it. Yeah, for the board review was just kind of the the conceptual outline of the committee along with the role and scope of, of the committee that it would be a, a letter or a memo coming from the board to the committee once it's established and then I also put together a draft press release and application uh, material so we're ready to launch if the board is ready um, but we're also open to any suggested changes on those documents so I liked it a lot I think you've done a good job of creating the people and you know positions and the goals and everything one thing I was thinking about might be good to put in this is that when I was reading about the scope, it's pretty broad, like it gets into leases and buying buildings, et cetera. I, I feel like we only want to use the committee on things we want to use it on. I don't think we should assign everything to them. And so is that the way it's set up now? Because Yeah, the way it's set up is, is the board would assign specific projects. Okay. Yeah. As long as that, I didn't. I didn't remember that part. And I didn't. Yeah, kind of on the rule and scope um, in the first paragraph, the board will assign the committee capital projects to review. And then the next paragraph tries to give some parameters. In general, these are what the types of projects. But Well, that's a good clarity because I was thinking at some point you'd start to send it all there, but let's not do that. Let's don't do that because there's a lot of things we're comfortable deciding and talking well, about. And they're just not high profile or, or yeah. challenging as much. Yeah, so I would see ones. it as a sp specific board assignment. Good, okay. Good, clar good clarity. And does it, and does it meet when called, so to speak, or? Yeah, I, I picture at first there might be a couple of general meetings where the committee members can learn about uh, the county's budget process, capital projects, um, public contracting, just so that, that the committee members have some baseline knowledge. Um, so we'd get them up to speed on that, and then it would be when the board assigns uh, projects. One other possibility, we had the one with person with experience estimating commercial building construction costs, the person with public sector project experience, but I was sitting in the budget committee last week and happened to be next to a banker. Mm -hmm. I was thinking a banker might be, you know, somebody that's done lending. I mean, there were, there's some people that know a lot about construction because they've done it themselves in their own business, but then they, I don't know, that would be another... Yeah, we could add an additional position. Yeah, I like that. I was, th I was thinking of one of our people, one of our budget committee members. But there's, I mean, there's people like that in the community that might be helpful. Uh, costs and experience. Yep, we'll add we'll add another position. That's fine with me, and and I'm supportive of the idea. In fact, uh, um, you know, I kind of look forward to that. Feedback, you know, I mean, if they get to a good juicy discussion about some of these projects and get set some direction to it, it'll it'll help everybody. And really, it's nice. I mean, as a we, we there's a lot of members or members of the community that are very knowledgeable and would be willing to donate their time and knowledge and expertise because we're because they want to be part of of their community and local government. So it's a, it's a good opportunity to, to tap into that that knowledge throughout the community. And bringing their expertise is always critical, you know. So I, I think it's um, a worthwhile project, you know, is making this committee evaluate things that we really have questions about. And I, I, don't, I just think it's um, worthwhile. Yeah. So thank you for that idea, Commissioner yep. Henderson. We will, we will get the materials out, and then once we have the application finalized and links, um, I can forward it to the board in case you have people that you would like to forward it to in terms of applicants. I'll also work with the Builders Association and the Realtors to get the word out and anything else, any other outlets uh, that you have in mind. Okay. Good. Great. Do we need a, 
a motion to approve this new committee or? Yeah, I think it would be good to have a minutes motion so, just so we have it on the record. So I'll move that uh, the board um, approve the creation of a facility project review committee as um, outlined in this, um, I don't know what you want to call it, this memo or uh, with the addition of an addition, one more person on the committee from the banking or lending uh, field. I'll second it. Just one, one quick question for clarification. The way it's proposed is, is this committee would not sunset. Um, this would just be an ongoing committee until the board at the time decides to disband it or not assign projects. Alternatively, um, this board could put a, a one or two year or, or a sunset period, but that's up to, to um, this board. Well, oh, I'd sunset it. I don't know. Three years, maybe, it just so there's, it comes back up to a board discussion at some point. December 31st, um, two and a half years from now? 2022 <coughs> would be two and a half years. Yeah, but, uh, yeah there you go. Just, just to bring it up as a trigger for discussion. Yeah, and that way if, if the board at the, at, in, on December 31st, 2022, if they don't want to continue it, it's a little bit easier to explain to the members yeah. that right. just, it was something. And at least they know what they're committing to. It's not for the, the rest of your life. Right. It's only for two and a half years. <laughs> so, yes, we need... It's we, voluntary. If it's too much of a hassle, then nobody has to be on it. I know. I know. So. Um, Commissioner Henderson? I vote yes. Mr. Devon? Yes. And the chair votes yes. So and that was amended. To as yes. Amended. yes, as I amended. Agreed. Thank you. Good. Okay, uh, going through my other items. So, uh, Nick lelac has been doing a great job for uh, South County Planning Commission seat. I uh, just wanted to let staff know that uh, there's another uh, cycle that I can offer to uh, um, recruiting that position. So I don't know if, if you've uh, been following that, but we do have one applicant, um, but it's kind of open till filled. So we're just looking to get a little bit more activity before we close that up. So just, yeah, just yeah. so you guys hear that. Okay. Good to hear. Um, the Pine Fire and the Pine Community Health Center yes. um, working on the, the transport uh, uh, ambulance, calling the ambulance um, protocols. Uh, there's an email just from today proposing a, a meeting on June 18th asking for a commissioner. So uh, I'd be available unless somebody else is into that already. That was my question. I sent it to Tom and Dave. So Good. You're available. Great. Oh, I don't know if I'm available. I think but I'm going to be, but yeah. <laughs> you'll put it on your schedule then. Yeah. Okay. But, yeah, but uh, yeah, well, just, I just saw it quick enough this morning to bring it here. That's all. When I went to one of their meetings last year, they brought that up with me, the whole issue of. Ooh, that's the same time as the fire year discussion for all the fire agencies. Oh. But I'll, I'll go to this. At, uh, the fire meeting's at 1030. I'll start at 10 o'clock at this one. Okay. Yeah, that was brought up with I went to that board meeting and uh, – the, the issue of uh, not having funding really to do their transports all the way to the hospital and it's not fair that they're having to do it with all the tour that's tourism related and how do we is that's that's the issue right uh, I think it's the st. Charles Clinic calling for medical transports between their two facilities and uh, the um, ambulance service of Lapine fire is not tax funded mm -hmm. and supported um, so then if a patient ends up in a situation where a doctor called for a transport and it's not fitting under somebody's insurance, somebody's got to pay the bill. And the person that went to the medical facility didn't know a bill was coming for thousands of dollars. A uh, doctor wants the highest medical care. Uh, and Lapine Fire is like, well, why are we taking all these extra rides and it's going to cost our you know, district money where it's not appropriate you know so it's just a business case yeah that, and I, I that's I was gonna say I'm sympathetic with what their yeah. problem is and I you know I talked a little bit about well isn't it part of tourism they say a lot of their calls that relate to people on the river you know and some of it's related to tourism and so you know one little shoots was, you just stand up it's not uh, the, <laughs> the big city the big the shoots the, they were referring to the people they pull off the river they have to save and I, I don't know how many there are but so uh, so I talked about funding but I, I guess once you open that door of like TRT funding to go to one emergency service it would, would it then go to others and 
Didn't we well, talk about this? Well, at this point, week? we want the community to understand the, the issue because, I mean, I'm not off. I'm not going to go to this meeting offering any resources. We are the, uh, you know, ambulance service area authority or entity, but, I mean, that's just defining who does service where. There's no, the, no commitment uh, financially. Didn't we talk yeah. about that, Tom, last year? I don't recall it pertaining to fine fire. I know this, this issue has been around for a while, but I don't, I don't recall specifically the use of TRT for their no. medical transports. Okay, maybe I just thought it in my head. So your know. point's well taken, though, in terms of sort of breaking the seal. On yeah. like that. I know I did talk about the Lapine um, fire station next to Crosswater. They actually last year were driving with a, a seriously injured, critically injured person in their ambulance going up um, north on 97 and they were with their lights flashing and they said they were going really, really, really fast and they were passed. So that was, that was the scary story, you know, with the speeds on our highways that when I was uh, down there last spring. But I, I did want to point out thank you to Chris Doty, uh, sent me a picture of Harper Ridge and the fact that the county has put in um, a bathroom right there where there, people are parking and the facility looks really um, top notch and I think it is making a huge difference down there. Very clearly uh, marked for the 50 parking spots. So when it's full, people know they have to go somewhere else and apparently I've had good feedback about it so far. I've had a lot of, yeah, I've had a lot of good feedback about it. And then um, Sisters was actually what, watching us to see what day was that was Monday, and they were um, Sisters um, Economic Council, and they were very delighted with our funding for them. So, so uh, feedback. Just, this is a draft of that AOC District Two meeting. It's a generic draft. I'm sure it's going to all the districts, but it talks about COVID-19 and then legislative needs as the two main areas. Uh, so. You know, we can do whatever we want with this. We could add to it or, you know, even during the meeting, we could bring up whatever we want. Um, I don't know why we aren't having this as a lunch because we could now. Well, District 2, this is they'd have to, they'd have to Arnie and here. Lake and I know, but Klamath they'd love to come here. It's only, what is it, Klamath, Lake, and is Harney also in District Jefferson and Crook. Yeah. yeah. Well. We all invite them all here. You could organize it, for yes. Next Tuesday. Is it Tuesday? Or, yeah, next Tuesday the 9th. Okay, well, it's sure. just a thought. I mean, it would be nice to get to see people. Yeah, that, yeah. Wouldn't it? We could all have, get our own table here and have a lunch. I'm sure Sharon would love 80 this. people. No, she doesn't want to say that. It's not that many people, is it? How many did we do last year? Like 30 or something, wasn't it? In the room? Down? Remember, it was a pretty small room. Well, we haven't got to phase two quite yet. We got to. Oh, oh, that's going to be Friday. Yeah. Or actually, maybe Saturday. Also, uh, the Greater Bend Rotary has asked me to speak next Tuesday. So this is a Zoom meeting. I know that, and I'm sensitive that we've done the three commissioners in the past at Rotary meetings. Uh, this is a Zoom request just for commissioner update after budget. So. Okay. There we go. So um, the other thing I just wanted to um, make clear so you knew my position we had this lease agreement with the uh, for this hotel, 25 room hotel, um, and it kind of stopped on my desk. I was surprised when it come came back. We had a discussion of it here. We'd approved the content, and then it got changed again. And we were just supposed to approve that. And I felt like um, it's gone so far that now we're leasing a motel. Period. And then we have another agreement so somebody's going to pay us to lease the motel so they can use it the whole time. And if it was up to me, I probably would have, uh, if we were really going out on a limb leasing a hotel that they're not even a party to, that they somehow, you know, neighbor impact's no longer on the agreement, I didn't feel that we should go forward. I think that, and this is just ongoing part of that whole discussion, and I just wanted you to know what I thought was that if, we would have started there we wouldn't have done it that way if we, if we would have said you guys have to go find something because now what we're doing is we're giving a three-month homeless we're creating a three-month homeless shelter opportunity for neighbor impact which was never our need or our goal and unless i would like to hear if either of you wanted to do that because i assumed we didn't but if one if the i'd like to know whether either of well you i think ever of trying to start a homeless shelter that the oh, yeah. county is yeah, the not, tenant on. Yeah. 
Well, uh, so my my thought process is we're backing ourselves into uh, not. I mean, not that it was a negative thing. We we got ourselves down the path where we needed to go for having the opportunity to house somebody that's COVID positive in the uh, uh, you know homeless community. I mean, that was the goal, a requirement, a phase requirement. Uh, so this this was a uh, scenario that fits that. Um, I mean, I understand what you're saying. You know, it ends up being we we've got a clear and direct contract, and some but somebody else is paying. Um, you know, that was that was I don't know, negotiated. I mean, that's just the way that is. So uh, I do not see it as a long-term facility for uh, anything more than this period of time with full funding uh, backing us up. So I mean, I, we're close. I, I I hear what you're saying. You know, we didn't intend on um, having a facility for. Um, you know, just unhoused people at this point in time. But for the COVID purpose, that's the reason. Mm -hmm. Mr. Dare, what's your position on this? My position is that it was a requirement and it seemed to, you know, it vacillated. First it was 175000 then it dropped from that. Um, there seemed to be only one actual location in the whole county that, was going to work for it. And if we do have an epidemic and we didn't have this facility, let's say after July 4th, we would be in so much trouble. And I, you know, I, I feel like we were actually, we were backed, we were backed up and we didn't really have a choice. But we, we had to do it, and who knows what's going to happen this summer. Um, you know, maybe things will continue on, you know, on a positive basis how our numbers have been doing so well. But what if something does change? What, what you know, summer, people are going to start coming here. Everyone seemed to be backing away with actually even negotiating over this. So your, is it your desire to have the county funding a homeless shelter? No. Play by room? But we're not funding or, or, it. Or being liable for, I guess, is what we're... So, we could be funding it if, well, if they... If but it's they, a, uh, Emergency uh, Solutions thing. Grant. Remember, ESG is something that Neighbor Impact has used in the past, and they used some this winter. And an ESG line was funded in the, in the CARES Act. So this that it's truly coming. The money's coming right from emergency funding at the federal level through our community action agency, and we're the partner there. So... And then were you both... Asked if you approved it. Yeah, I did. So you both, I, you told you. So yes. you, just so you know, I didn't know that it happened, and that's why I asked this morning. So, I mean, you have a right to do that, but I'm not really happy that it was approved without me knowing that it was approved, and I wasn't told that it was approved until I asked. And so this is the kind of thing where, and I guess this is something the administrator can do because it's under 150. But I just want to know who's responsible if this does go sideways. That you know, this is the we're really going out of limb. And when you say there wasn't any other options, you know, that thing that um, Glenn Katerra w owns would be a motel that we could have used th three or four rooms in, might have met our standard, I don't know. But I just, again, just want to voice my uh, disapproval of being backed into a corner where this was our only way. And I don't know how it got brought up in the last round that, oh, neighbor impact can't be on the agreement because they took themselves out of the agreement with the hotel. They actually weren't a signer anymore. So it's like if they'd said from the start, we want you to go lease a property and we'll pay for it, do you guys, are you in for that? I don't know if we would have done it. I, I personally would have rather almost rented the motel and had it sit there empty than have be the exposure to a whole slew, slew of things we, we're now exposed to. So that's just... I want you to know my thoughts on it because we didn't get a chance to talk about the revised uh, document other than it was sent to me in, with this pressure to get it signed. So we're, but anyway. Good. It, uh, I'd say, I mean, it's the speed of information. You know, we, um, it was laid out that we're talking about an ordinance uh, supporting, uh, you know, churches and churches gathering. And from that moment on, it, our emails got filled up. And it, it, it's been a, uh, you know, a challenging time to kind of stay ahead of some of that stuff and uh, 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 going, um, and then just watching the emails kind of queue up because this is what happened to me, especially with that AOC meeting. They sent an email a couple of weeks ago, or a week and a half ago, and I didn't respond. And then they called me, and then 
I found the email later, and it's just amazing right now. Just in the budget week on top of it. So. And the budget week on top of yeah. it, yes. Well, and that's true. I get that with the speed of information. But to me, there's always time to say, well, well yeah, are, we so, gonna, are we all going to sign this agreement, or do you want to have another discussion about this agreement? Yeah. And, and we didn't apparently legally need to do that here, but that's just a matter of, you know, we'd, we'd agreed on one document, then the next document is parceled out, is how I feel like. So would have liked to have the discussion about it at some point. Okay. So, where are we at now? I don't have any other items. No more items? No, so. Okay. We had a couple of executive sessions uh, scheduled um, for today. Um, the, there was a one for property uh, related. To, uh, Becky Johnson, I think you got uh, some communication from Christy earlier on and we wanted to also follow up on the uh, lease uh, with, for the district attorney we brought up a couple weeks ago that you asked to be deferred. And uh, I think there was also a request for follow up on labor from Monday's discussion that we bring, uh, I don't know if it's one or both back today for follow up. So it's your okay. pleasure on, on which of those we would do in what order. Okay, so we are now going to leave our um, regular meeting. Whitney? 